Good evening and welcome to the 1448th regular board meeting held on July 27th, 2020. I want to let you know that we did not make any, uh, we did not take any action in closed session. And I will take the roll call for the board for who's here. So I have Trustee Brown. I see you on here. I believe you're here. <laughs> Okay, I have Trustee Irvin. Do I see Trustee Irvin on here? Don't see Trustee Irvin. Uh, so, uh, Trustee Lopez. I see you down there. I see Trustee Lopez. All right, Trustee Newman. Yes, I see Trustee Newman. Trustee Walker. I see Trustee here. Walker. Vice President West. Here. Yeah, she's here. And pre um, Board President Marks is here. So hopefully we can get Trustee Irvin. Oh, there he is. Just checking. Trustee Irvin, making sure that you're on with us. So just checking all that. Um, all right, now I will go to our translator services. I'd like to refer anybody who needs translator services to Ms. Paula Valbuena, who is on this virtual conference. Ms. Valbuena, please go ahead. Thank you, President Marks. Buenas noches. Habla Paula Valbuena. Si necesita servicios de interpretación al español, por favor llame al 1805-324-7680 e ingrese el código de acceso 165-982-526 más la tecla numeral. Este es un número totalmente gratuito. Nuevamente, llame al número de teléfono 1805-324-7680. 80 e ingrese el código de acceso 165982526 más la tecla numeral. También puede acceder a estas instrucciones por medio de nuestro sitio web mcs4kids.com dirigiéndose a la parte superior de la página haciendo clic en Quick Links y haciendo clic también en Board Agendas para ver la agenda de esta noche. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ba Valbuena. Appreciate that. All right, now we will have our moment of silence. And tonight I just like to dedicate it to praying for health and well being in our community as we've had a lot of struggles lately. So we're just going to think about that and, and um, during our moment of silence. Thank you. And I know all of you who have who know someone who has COVID, it's a, it's a struggle right now for them. So we're hoping they recover quickly. All right, we are going to go on to the announcements of good evening. And this open session meeting of the Board of Trustees is being live streamed at the direction of the board. The live stream is available on the district's website and the recordings will be available for viewing the day after the board meeting. Modesto City Schools board meetings are closed to the public to follow state guidelines and social distancing until further notice. This action was taken in response to the governor's executive order N2520 and resolution 1920-17, delegating authority to take necessary action to protect students and staff from the spread of the coronavirus, also known as COVID-19, adopted by Modesto City Schools on March 18th. 2020 of this year. Regarding public comment, Modesto City Schools has provided an opportunity for public to provide comment. It is outlined on the agenda. The public has been given an opportunity to call in and leave a voicemail or send us a comment via email address. This practice will continue throughout the time we are conducting virtual meetings. For members of the public that are interested in commenting in the future, we welcome your comments and we received some for tonight. So I believe we have 15 comments total for tonight's meeting. And so we will be doing that. So yes, we will now, it is A4, time to lead the board in the Pledge of Allegiance. So that is, I had to read that before we did it. That's how it's on there. <laughs> All right, so please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, whoops, it's down over here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, you may be seated. 
All right, now we will go on to item A5. The superintendent, uh, Dr. Noguchi, will do welcome and announcements. Superintendent. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you again for your time and anyone who is, is tuning in tonight. Um, I am very excited at tonight's board um, presentations and this board meeting. We've got a number of reports and action items that I think really propel us forward as we move forward to opening schools, which is just a roughly two weeks away. So uh, one presentation we have is we're gonna revisit opening schools yet again. I think this is the fourth one you guys have seen in, in our attempt to trying to keep you guys um, up to speed with where we're at. Um, good news is we have um, a letter of agreement with um, MTA and we're working in close partnership with CSEA. And so we wanna share with you um, really the outcome for that, but we think that we found, came up with some good compromises that really work to ensure we have a high quality instructional program for our kids, while at the same time recognizing safety and security um, for our staff. So very happy with that report. The next one is a resolution on ethnic studies. Um, I really believe that what the state is doing relative to their work in supporting just really the understanding and the teaching of different races and, and ethnicities in our history. And so I look forward to really just showing support for that work at the, at the state level. And then last, we um, are bringing to you a framework, which we've been working on for the last three months. We, it, really the purpose of this framework is um, equity and, and racial justice. I wanna get your input. So give me your feedback, your input. It's in draft phase, it's a draft stage. So where do we wanna add, modify and adjust, tweak a little bit, um, but love to get your feedback on that. We've taken it out to, I don't know, five or six different groups um, thus far, and we will continue um, as we move forward. Um, we just presented it to um, MTA last week and CSEA. Um, we know that we've got some additional input to get, but um, would love to get your input. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you, President Marks. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And now we will move on to A6, the Board of Education members reports. So I have Vice President West is up first. Uh, I did not attend any meetings, so I have nothing to report at this time. Thank you. Okay, that's all right. Trustee Lopez. Um, I haven't attended any meetings. I've, I've been a part of the Latino Emergency Council meetings um, over the phone. Um, they've been sharing the, the great work that they've been doing um, around COVID and uh, making sure that we all stay healthy. So I know that I said it many times, but we gotta, we gotta stay, stay healthy, stay distant, um, stay close virtually but more than and then wear your mask wear any anything that makes you feel comfortable makes that's also helping uh folks stay safety and stay healthy that's right and wash our hands <laughs> a lot <laughs> that's great thank you trustee lopez trustee walker oh no i'm in the same spot i've been for four months still at home still following every recommendation much <laughs> to my dismay okay trustee newman I have not been able to attend any meetings, just working and uh, keeping my face covered at work. <laughs> Thank <laughs> <Yes>. you. <laughs> Trustee Brown. Yes, I was able to attend the uh, virtual construction meeting last week, and I'm pleased to, uh, just along with that uh, committee, let the public know the great things that are happening this summer the opportunity that social distancing has provided for work on our campuses has really been used uh, effectively. And our staff has, uh, along with the contractors that we're working with, has made great progress. And that continues. And the, the window is still open. If we find a silver lining, uh, Campuses without students are safe places for great work to happen, uh, even though that's not what we hoped would be the case, but uh, great things are happening on our campuses. And if you drive around town, uh, you'll see some beautiful paint jobs and uh, you'll see parking lots that are improving. You'll see that uh, people are up on the roofs uh, fixing uh, along with uh, single access points at additional campuses. I just 
Kent, uh, I know if I keep going, I'll miss something important, but uh, lots of great things are happening. And then I do have one other important uh, meeting to report. Uh, Cheryl and I were able to go see our little grandson who uh, has been born with complications and uh, is doing extremely well. He's home and acting like a normal newborn. So we're real happy and excited that uh, he has survived and thrived. So that's my report. Oh, that's sweet. All right, thank you, Trustee Brown. Trustee Irvin? Um, yes, yeah, so a few things. I, I, I went by the uh, um, uh, couple of the uh, sites, uh, nutrition sites and, and, and observed again some of the great work that's going on in, in feeding our, our students and families out in in the community there um also um i attended a couple of zoom meetings on the ethnic studies bill that's being proposed in which we have um a resolution before our board there i uh, was on a zoom state statewide meeting with some of those statewide folks who uh, have been uh pushing that bill forward advocating and then also with some uh, uh, local uh, folks as well who are also uh, advocating for uh, ethnic studies um, within the framework of our, our uh, curriculum as well. Also uh, attended a community, uh, a community meeting um, as well um, on the call was their superintendent and uh, Mark Herbst uh, about the uh, issues around equity and things like that. Um, so I got a chance to participate in in that um, that Zoom call as well, and uh, that's about it. Thank you, appreciate it. I also had some meetings. I met on July 8th and July 15th with the Northern California and San Joaquin delegates. On the 15th, we had uh, 24 attended because we were also doing the budget and getting an update from CSBA staff on the budget. <clears throat> but we also had a great discussion. The, what I took from that was um, we had one school district that was on there was Patterson and they have delayed the school start date to after Labor Day, which was a really interesting. So we had a quite a discussion about that because um, all these 24 different school districts in the Central Valley have been trying to figure out how to navigate. Mm, um, hang on, I got a little tickle in my throat. Going to take a cough here. So we were navigating um, what we should do and how we should do that. And so it was just a good discussion on how the different districts are uh, preparing for um, starting school. Some of them are starting next week. So August 2nd or 3rd, uh, Monday, next week they're starting. So they will have a whole week on us. So we'll find out how they do. And that's mostly in San Joaquin County. So I'll let you know um, when I hear from them. Then on um, the 17th, I listened to the staff a town hall meeting and that was great. I got to hear Dr. Noguchi share with the staff on and answer a lot of questions. I could not believe how many questions people had. They were great questions. Um, so one of the things that I took away from that was just the priority of TK, kinder and first grade, that that's been uh, the priority and then also foster youth and homeless. That that's our, our main goal is if we can um, get them back in the classroom in a learning environment, that's what we wanna do. But we know that we're dependent on how uh, this COVID-19 is uh, impacting and how we can reduce the uh, number of people that are in the hospitals and how it's being contacted by uh, others. So hopefully we can figure out a really good way to do that and get those numbers down. And then I attended also the um, Parents Leading Change, uh, Dr. Parker, formerly Dr. Parker meeting, and we had Mark Herbst gave us an update on what we're going to hear tonight about the uh, ethnic studies, I'm not ethnic studies, the uh, some injustice. I lost it. Uh, anyway. Equity and racial justice framework. I got you. I got ethnicity and ethnic studies stuck in my head and I couldn't get it out. So um, anyway, I was really appreciative of the group be, having in, input and information. Uh, Mr. Herbst did a superb job explaining to the group what the plans are and kind of went through the outline. 
So I, I was very pleased that we could do that um, before this meeting tonight and just be able to get that information out there for the public to know. And especially the Dr. Parker Committee that started in, I believe, 2000 or 2001 um, when we formed that group. So that was a really uh, helpful group to talk to. And I appreciate Jocelyn, who's the president of that group, who's done a great job leading us this year. So that was my report for the meetings that I've had, just quite a few with the delegate assembly. We've had a lot going on and it's kind of, I think all of us appreciate just hearing dialogue from other school districts and what's happening because you don't feel alone. All of us are facing the same struggles, the same problems uh, at the same time. And so just hearing how each other's kind of trying to navigate that has been really good. Uh, and I appreciate our district and where we are right now and what our plans are. So that's been great to share that with them. So now we will move on to our next item, which is our approval of the consent agenda. And I would like to know, are there any um, comments wait, on consent agenda before we vote? No. Okay, thank you. Oh, and trustee from the Walker. public. Okay, none from the public. No comments from the public. Looks like I have a hand raised by Trustee Walker and maybe another one. So go ahead, Trustee Walker. Hey, uh, my comment was that there's a lot in here. If we were in a regular meeting and a lot of curriculum and I didn't go through all of it, but I went looking for specifically on the MVA stuff. And I just thought it was worth noting my concerns three or four weeks ago on math, what they were doing compared to what we were doing. And having looked at that outline, as the agenda came out, I am pleased to see that they are running a straight traditional algebra, geometry, algebra two framework. It's not this monkey business of integrated binds, whatever they call it, but it was just encouraging because at some point those students who want to move out of an MBA back into a traditional classroom, be able to, how would that map up to what we were doing, which was my concern then? because you can't map a traditional pathway up to an integrated pathway. And so I was just pleased to see that the Florida virtual stuff matched up with a traditional approach, which aligns with what we're doing as far as distance and in-classroom. And I think it also just makes me feel better as somebody who fought really hard to get us back there, that I even have support in Florida that I didn't even know about. <laughs> Other than that, Godspeed. That's great. Okay, and then I have Trustee Brown. Oh, you're muted. No? I didn't have anything. Sorry. Oh, not... Okay, it was on from maybe before. Okay, then I have Trustee West. Did you have a comment? Well, I had a question. Question: Should I save that? I had two questions. Are they on consent? Me? Are they for consent agenda items? It's for the um, virtual academy, kind of tagging on what John was saying. Oh, this this is the time because we are voting on that. Are we voting on that in consent? Aren't we? Yes. Yeah. So. Um, I just had I had two questions and one was um, some of the courses had textbooks listed and some did not have textbooks. So when there are none listed, who chooses the textbooks? Do the teachers who are teaching it? Hi, this is Lauren. Um, that's a great question. No, what we've done is we've matched them with our curriculum. So we wouldn't be purchasing new textbooks. Um, they would use ours. For example, if it's ninth grade English and there's no textbooks, I'm just making this example up, but there was no textbook, then they would be using our study sync to get through it. And you may have noticed also that we made sure that when there was an assignment due that um, the book was on our passport to literature, etc. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, and the second question was dealing with world languages. I noticed in the Modesto Virtual Academy, we had only um, French and Spanish. And at Bayer High School, I believe we're still offering the German class. So if students have taken one year of German and they go to the Virtual Academy and they need that second year of German, how do we bridge that gap? They, they would not be able to go, they would not be able to take German in that program. They would have to go distance learning. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, and Trustee Walker, did you raise your hand again? Yes, only because Trustee West brought up a good point that I was trying to get at in the same question about math. 
if I understand correctly, then what Ms. O'Dell just said, since the math courses did not list textbooks, those students in MBA will be using our new Pearson material? That is correct. They will use our materials. Ooh, it's like a double win through the end zone, spike the football, do a dance. Thank you. It just really was my concern is how we line those things up because that's a big deal and how it sets the foundation moving forward. And it just makes that decision just that much more, makes me want to do a little quick dance, but I'm not going to do that. All right, thank you. And I just had a, oh, Trustee Brown, did you mean to put your hand up? Yes, okay, this time it's it is, a, yes. <laughs> okay. So blending a couple of questions and um, ideas that have come up. Uh, so if a student has to go to the distance program for one course, are they able to do that and still stay within the virtual academy? So I, I wish I would have known all these questions were going to come up and we would have had Rachel Bark is here, folks, but I'll try to do the best that I can. And Lauren, you certainly can help. Um, if you are in um, the, the MVA, then you're in that full time. It's not doing it a course at a time. It's either that's your program for the year um, or to, up to the semester. Um, if, 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 you choose, if we are open and we're able to then move off into um, brick and mortar, brick and mortar. Um, so there's not an it, one individual class that we don't have the opportunity for that. <clears throat> I have to say it is a, a heavy lift to get 3000 kids with teachers. So while I'd love to um, work to support every nuance there is, the reality is we've got 3000 kids looking for teachers for MBA and that's what we need to focus on at this point. Yes. All Thank right. you. Thank you. And then my comment, I just appreciate staff helping me get through some of those modules I wasn't able to get into and read. And so I appreciate that because I said, wow, I need to be able to read these and so I can improve it tonight. So well, I'm planning on improving the uh, virtual academy, the yes, Modesto Virtual Academy with the Florida Virtual Academy curriculum. <laughs> So, so what what so can I make just a yeah. comment, President Marks? So what, what President Marks is alluding to in um, the Friday board communication, there was a link to be able to get into one of those modules. So it just kind of kind of gives you a flavor of what that curriculum looks like. She asked for a specific what was the module, President Marks? Life, life management skills. Right. And so we provided that for you. So you could go back on the Friday board communication if you want to take a look at what that looks like. We will open up all the classes to you as soon as we we are in this massive, you know, move over, move the courses over once they are approved and then we will give you full access and you can take a look at whatever courses that, that you would like to do. Yes, that was great. Thank you. And I did um, did some math too, some algebra and then also some um, anatomy physiology today. So that was great. I thank Mike Rich for helping me get through that. So thank you. And now I am ready for a motion from a board member to approve the consent agenda. It's been moved by Trustee Walker, seconded by Trustee Newman. All those in favor, please say aye. This is going to be tough because you don't all have your mics on. Aye. So if you turn your mics on, we're going to just go aye. I can't see aye. them all. Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. So I just want to make sure, did I have Trustee Lopez because I can't see you and Trustee Irvin, did you both vote aye? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. All right, thank you. So I believe there's no opposition. Okay, then we will, um, uh, motion passes unanimously. All right, moving on to item A8, the approval of the discussion, discussion action items. Do I have a motion? Is there any discussion on discussion action items? The order? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's all good. So I'll entertain a motion. I'll move. Okay, Trustee Walker and then Trustee Brown seconds that. Okay. All those in favor, if I could see you, it really helps. Could you please raise your hand? Aye. Aye. Aye and say aye. Okay, I see all of you, but Mr. Irvin. Did you, are you yeah. good, Mr. Irvin? Yeah. Any opposed? Okay, any opposed? We can't see you. So, okay, any opposed? Hearing none. Motion passes unanimously. All right, moving on to a nine period, period for public comment. And I believe that we thought one was gonna be on public comment, but I think it's moved to one of the items. So Ms. Noonan, are there any comments for the public, from the public? No, not general comments, just specific to items. So do you yeah. want me to read them as the items come up? 
Yes. Okay, so got I, it. Okay. I will ask you when we get to it, and I'll say, are there any comments, and then you can read those. So You got it. Okay. So, I'll await your cue. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, on to item B1, public hearing and approval of resolution number 20 slash 21 dash one, increasing school facilities fees for inflation in accordance with the determination of the state allocation board at its January 22nd, 2020 meeting. And Mr. Walterstorff will be giving this report. Actually, I will take oh, that, uh, President oh, Marks. This is Tim Zerley. Thank you, Tim. Okay, first I have to open, close the, the meeting, close the public meeting, and now I'm opening the public hearing. Okay, Mr. Zerley. Thank you, President Marks. Good evening, trustees. Um, this is normally a, a procedural uh, public hearing and, and resolution that is held every other year uh, as the state allocation board uh, increases, uh, authorizes increases to uh, school facility fees collected for inflation. And as noted uh, by President Marks on January 22nd, uh, 2020, the State Allocation Board did set a maximum fee of $4.08 per square foot for residential development um, and 66 cents per square foot for commercial development. This is an increase uh, currently is $3.79 per square foot for residential development and 61 cents uh, per square foot for commercial development. Uh, development. Normally you would see this uh, in the spring. We would have brought this public hearing to you in March. Uh, March 30th, it was scheduled to be uh, on the agenda. That was our very first virtual meeting and we were, we did not know how to hold a public hearing virtually and so that's why it was pulled. Um, now we've done some public hearings. We know how to do it, uh, which is why you see this now. So um, that's the reason for those of you that are used to seeing this every other year. It didn't happen in the spring um, and we're bringing it to you at this point. And we do um, recommend approval uh, of the resolution increasing uh, our current school facility fees. You're uh, muted, Cindy. Sorry, I was moving things around, didn't wanna be noisy. Um, Trustee Brown, I see we have a question from Trustee Brown. Yes, I uh, understand this is a responding to direction from the state committee, but a question for Mr. Zerley, is there any reaction from that committee with the current uh, COVID situation? Any adjustments that we could expect or is this going to last for two years? I have not been made aware of any pending adjustments or conversations about adjustments based on the, the current climate uh, of the pandemic. Um, if I, I can research that and, and respond and get back to you, but I have not heard of any other adjustments than the normal every other year inflationary adjustments. Thank you. Trustee Walker. Thank you, Mr. Zerley. Just one question, because it seems like compared to the old number to this number, would you call this a fairly large move up, even though we're only talking about dollars? Percentage wise, what you just described, seems larger than what I would expect. I'm not, I, I, I'm not, I don't have the inflation rates at, at my fingertips um, for this particular adjustment. So um, it is adjusted for inflation. And, and as inflation uh, grows, we're allowed to increase the rate proportionately. So that would be my answer to that. No, I was just curious. It just sort of triggered a thought in my mind because we're making an inflation move but yet when you look at the economy, we're in an imploding deflation. And Correct. so it's, it's a bit conflicted, if that makes sense. So I was just curious what the sort of reasoning behind it was. And it just occurred to me when you gave me the rates that it almost seems like two opposites facing each other. Inflation cross up, but at the same time, you've got a deflation economy going the other direction. And the only thing I can say on that is it was back in January of 2020. So um, it was it, it was pre pandemic um, and the economy was going in a different direction at that point in time. That makes a lot more sense now. Thank you. Um, Trustee Newman. Got it. <laughs> no, nope, you're muted now. It went back to mute. 
Got it. Okay. There it is. Um, so, uh, okay, is there a time limit, Mr. Zierly, on when we could take this action? Um, so basically, the, as I understand that this board takes action every two years, and we have the authority after they take action to raise it up to that level. We could decide to keep it where it is, or we could go somewhere in between, but no higher than that level. That's the authority they've granted us, right? That is correct. Okay. So is there a limit in terms of time of when we can act on that? We are in a weird, you know, they, they took this action in January and now we've got, you know, a, a number of, um, a number of, you know, different things in the economy with COVID. So um, that, that changes some things for, for certainly, you know, some landlords for, um, for, for builders and development. And so um, is there a time limit of when we could work, when we could do this, or is it imperative we do it now, or is it, is it something that we could wait on? No, and and which is the reason why um, the the this particular public hearing and resolution has been delayed from its normal. Yeah. There, there's no time frame for which which we can act, but we cannot increase until we act. If that makes sense, so we we yes. can. Th there's no that I'm aware of. There's there's no statutory requirement for us to act within so many days of the the action from the state allocation board. Um, and, and, but we cannot begin collecting until a certain amount of days after the board passes the resolution is my, this is my understanding. If that okay. answers your question, I, I think we can, I mean, we, we could delay this action. Um, if, if that's the direction of the board. And then we wouldn't look at it again, um, until the, the board, I mean, if we raised it, we wouldn't, we wouldn't we we couldn't we couldn't raise it again till the board takes action but we could we could lower it we have authority to lower it if we did take action in accordance with this board with the the board, board of allocation is that what it's called yes the state allocation state board. allocation board and then in, in con conjunction with our is also attached to the agenda and the public hearing is our justification study that allows basically justifies us to go up to the maximum allowable rate um, that the state allocation board sets. So we, yes, we could go, we could go somewhere in between. Um, it's it's up to the the direction of the board. Okay. So, well, I have a question on that. Has um, how much do you know what the actual increase was this year? I was trying to find it. I don't see it. I don't know if it went from three hundred and fifty to four hundred and eight, um, and then what it went up the year before. I found some charts, but they're mostly on the industrial ones. So I was like, wait a minute, I can't find it. So if you could find that maybe in the meantime and let me let us know or um, see. I just wanted to find out how much it's gone up this year or that they're asking us to increase it because it is we are living in really difficult times. So it's our current our current rate that we collect for a a, a residential development is three dollars and seventy nine cents a square foot. Okay. Where this action would raise it to four dollars and eight cents a square foot. Right. So like thirty. Which cents. is the maximum amount that under this particular uh, fee collection we could collect. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. All right, Mr. Uh, Trustee Brown. Do we answer your questions, Trustee Newman? Did you have any more? Okay. Trustee Brown. So while we've expressed some concern about the pandemic and uh, the deflationary economy, the cost of housing, the development uh, is booming right now. Prices are rising and the forecast for the immediate future is for that to continue because our availability is so tight. So I have no problem from the uh, from that perspective, recommending that we move forward with this. And this is only taxed upon the uh, developers or the new housing. This is not an increase in the taxes for the current homes. Is that correct? Unless a current homeowner decides to add livable square footage to their home. Um, 
Yes, that would be the only other case. And as Trustee Brown points out, um, those developments that are currently building or, or selling, um, they are all in uh, CFDs, uh, uh, community facility districts, and so they, they are not part of this, uh, this particular uh, fee collection. Right, because that's done by a different formula. So thank you, that's great. Okay, so are there any other questions or comments? And are there any comments on this item from the public? Um, there are not. Uh, no, there are not. There are not. I didn't think so, but I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> OK, My that's fine. All right, so now I will entertain a motion. Close the hearing. We have to close the public hearing, I believe. Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Closing public hearing, opening the public meeting. Now I'm at ready to entertain a motion. Got a tickle in my throat. <laughs> so moved. Moved by Trustee Walker. Second and by Trustee Irvin. Irvin. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> Sorry, it passes unanimously. Okay, hang on, I got a cop. Thank you. Okay, sorry, got allergies this time of the year. And so we'll see how we do here. And I will get a cough drop if my eyes keep watering. So we will move on to item. All right, item B2, report on distance online learning model. Is this gonna be Mr. Goodo? Yes, it is. Good okay, evening. all right, Thank you're you. up. Thank you, President Marks. Uh, Trustees, Superintendent Dr. Noguchi, it's my pleasure this evening to be joined by Associate Superintendent Mark Herbst and Associate Superintendent Dr. Lauren O'Dell uh, to review and provide you a report uh, on the Modesto City Schools distance learning model. We're gonna talk about the uh, letter of agreement that we entered into with our uh, labor partners, Modesto Teachers Association last week. Uh, as well as discuss some of the supports that are being provided to staff via the CIPD, uh, as well as some of the, uh, the mandates and regulations that we are following for our, to support our English learners. So our goal alignment, of course, uh, th this is very uh, highly centered around uh, in academic achievement and instruction. So we've got goal one there, increasing academic achievement and equitable access. Uh, something that we're working very diligently here, particularly so in the next Brad, two weeks. You need to Mr. Goodell, presentation. Mr. Goodell, you're not you're not sharing your PowerPoint. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, my apologies. We'll okay. go with Mr. How's Goodell. That? Mr. Goodell is very impressed with the presentation thus far. <laughs> Game on. <laughs> Game on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Herbst. So uh, uh, yes. Back to the presentation. Goal one, ac increasing academic achievement, equitable access. Uh, of course, goal two, working with our employees for professional development. You're gonna hear about that this evening, as well as goal three, providing a safe, welcoming, and respectful learning environment for all members of our community. So uh, the, the foundation of the distance learning <laughs> letter of agreement with Modesto Teachers Association uh, outlines which teachers are reporting for work. And uh, there are a few exceptions. Uh, all teachers are expected to report to the school site, uh, except for uh, teachers that choose to go through the interactive process to address any medical conditions or, or high risk conditions that they might have, as well as certificated staff that have children uh, zero to 12 years that are having uh, issues around child care, et cetera. So they were going to they will work through uh, human resources uh, to address that. And then we will work with the sites to, to work out the details. Um, we have uh, accountability for work expectations. I know that was a big concern uh, for all of us, for our community, for our parents, for our students, for our teachers and for the board around uh, the expectations for what distance learning will look like versus what it looked like last spring. Uh, and we do have accountability in there, i.e. Uh, students will be uh, given grades. We've got some very uh, regimented schedules about when instruction will take place. And you'll see more about that when we go through the uh, daily instructional schedule. Uh, and also outlined in the LOA is the idea that uh, materials and internet 
uh, access or the responsibility of the employee if they are working from home and not from their, their classroom or the school site. So starting with uh, TK6 distance learning parameters, uh, all of our elementary school sites will be following the same daily instructional schedule. Uh, they'll start each day with a morning meeting with their students lasting anywhere from five to 15 minutes, really just checking in with students, um, that social emotional check uh, before they get into the meat of the instructional day. Uh, we talked last week uh, at last week's board meeting about the state minimum requirements for daily instructional minutes uh, here. These are the LOA direct instruction minimums, meaning uh, at TKK, I want to say it was 190, 180 uh, instructional minutes uh, per day, uh, but this is 90 minutes of direct instruction, meaning that the teachers will be providing live, engaged, direct instruction for 90 of those minutes each day. Similarly, at grades one through three and four through six, uh, they will also be doing uh, direct instruction for that minimum amount of time. Okay, the instructional schedule uh, for TK6, uh, you can see each day is outlined there. I will point out that the ELA block and the math block uh, are interchangeable for sites depending on uh, any number of different factors that might need to uh, create uh, schedules that would support itinerant uh, staff or special educators that are supporting uh, specific students at school sites. So we've got some flexibility there, but generally the schedule will hold true throughout the day. Uh, so you'll get direct instruction through the ELA block. There's a break there for students and for staff, you know, that the digital fatigue, having that break in there, uh, moving into the block of math. Um, and then having that hour lunch, that was an area that came up last board meeting about uh, do we have enough time? And we did adjust that uh, this past week. And so we've expanded that to an hour uh, as well as, uh, and so then that just kind of pushed everything into the afternoon and language and writing will take place uh, from 1230 to one. And then we've got a, pardon me, we've got a 90 minute block uh, where these other activities will be taking place. Our nutrition services, uh, we finalized the plan uh, last week. So curbside meal pickup locations at 20 sites, and I'll go over the, uh, the slide that will list those, slides here, the, those sites here in a moment, uh, so bear with me. All of the meal locations will be open for pickup between 10.35 and 12.30, and I think we talked about this last week. Uh, we do have that two-hour window that if parents need to go down or maybe there is a, a neighborhood, um, you know, the community mom that's gonna help out with, with uh, some other homes in the, in the area or the neighborhood. If they have the student's meal uh, information, their barcoded card uh, or information, they would be able to go down, let's say, and pick up five or six student lunches to get them back. So that would start at 1035. Uh, however, students can walk down anywhere between uh, that meal time of 11.30 to 12.30. So we've got some overlapping meal service time there. Uh, and regardless of what school they attend, uh, meal pickups can be done at any of those locations. So students and parents will need to have a barcoded ID card uh, unique to each student. Uh, Nutrition Services is mailing out uh, information to all families uh, prior to the start of school that will outline uh, this process. This is different than the summer feeding program in which students uh, or families could show up to get meals and they did not have to provide uh, the barcoded or specific information. Uh, so we, we are gonna communicate that out that they do need to be prepared to, to share that specific information for students. Um, and that our nutrition services staff is uh, they're bobbing and weaving and they're creating what they need to for these distribution sites, which is gonna require utilization of cafeterias and multi-purpose rooms for meal preparation uh, on a daily basis. So as I mentioned, these are the 20 sites uh, that will be functioning as, as curbside meal pickup locations. You'll notice that the uh, schools uh, written in red, those are new sites being added from the uh, summer meal locations. 
And at right, Orville Wright, we do have uh, some construction uh, going on in that area. So we are gonna continue to use George Rogers Park, which is adjacent to Orville Wright, uh, while that road work is underway. So at this point, I am gonna turn it over to Mr. Herbs to take it. Why, thank you, Brad, I appreciate that. Um, Brad kind of touched on the direct instructional minutes, but despite those minutes that he mentioned, the TK6 teachers still provide support outside their minimum minutes of direct instruction. So this can come in a variety of different forms. It can include individual and small group supports. It can also include monitoring independent practice. So they're still engaged in working with the, uh, with the students. Teachers also, as a result of the MOU, they have to establish office hours under the guise of communica uh, communicating with their families. This is gonna give the opportunity for parents to pose questions and get assistance on their di uh, distance learning. So vital piece in order to make sure that we're uh, re uh, responsive uh, to parent and family needs. Mr. Godot, next slide, please. Wednesdays have that slightly different schedule based on what Mr. Godot had showed you. Um, the, that, 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 that schedule, which isn't as regimented as the others, still engages our teachers with our students in being able to provide individual targeted small group and in some cases individual instruction, check-ins, assessments, and additional feedback on how kids can access or better access their distance learning experience. This will also be an opportunity for them to attend IEPs, um, et cetera. So there's, there's definitely still some merit behind what occurs on Wednesday. Okay. There's a couple other highlights that I want to talk about. Um, English language development, that regimented schedule that we need to provide our English language learners, that's going to be provided in the language and writing block that you saw on the schedule that you guys have. So that's going to ensure that our uh, 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 English language learners are getting that ELD. Brad had touched on it before, so I don't want to be repetitive, but a principal with the uh, support of their leadership team can switch the math and ELA blocks, which could assist potentially in scheduling. Um, during the 1 to 2.30 block, teachers will still engage with students in either individual meetings. It is an opportunity for them to assign independent work, potential physical education, and or enrichment activities. So that'll occur during the 1 to 2.30 block. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Herbst. At 712, we do have uh, some other distance learning parameters, uh, recognizing that the block schedule, which you'll see here in a moment, are 80 minutes in length. Uh, a minimum of 30 minutes of those 80 minutes, each period must include 30 minutes of direct instruction. Uh, support will be provided during the additional class period uh, or during the additional class time, uh, individual or group. Uh, similar to our, our elementary sites, we will have set virtual office hours for teachers each week, one hour per week. And on Wednesdays, you'll see a similar uh, layout relative to the schedule on Wednesdays where we will be able to do small group individual sessions as well as collaboration. So here you can see the uh, junior high and high school daily instructional schedule. Uh, the zero and eight periods uh, will start at 750. And then we've got first, second, and third on Mondays. And then you can see the, the layout on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Wednesdays, again, uh, is the uh, more flexibility and how we're providing the supports uh, as well as collaboration. Important to note here is that on Wednesdays, we have a rotating homeroom meeting uh, at the elementary level at TK6. We, we've got that morning meeting every day of the week. Uh, at our junior highs and high schools, they will actually have an assigned homeroom, uh, which will function as a check-in, uh, as well as providing any number of different uh, supports and announcements information for students. Again, you can also see that we have office hours outlined in the pres or in the uh, the schedule. So here you can see the uh, rotating homeroom schedule, uh, so that uh, any one particular teacher or period. Uh, doesn't have the homeroom uh, all year long. It will work on a rotating basis. So in the month of August, uh, first period will function as the homeroom. So every first period teacher, uh, their roster for first period, that's where they'll be for homeroom and we'll rotate that through January and so on and so forth through the end of the year. Uh, on every Wednesday, uh, one of the, the drawbacks of the uh, kind of the, 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 the lack of scheduling in the spring 
uh, and we wanted to avoid that on Wednesdays uh, in this model was the uh, idea that teachers wouldn't schedule uh, or overlap their supports for students. So here we have the framework for teachers uh, to provide spe uh, specific blocks of time during the Wednesday group time for specific content areas. As far as the digital learning platforms, we do have uh, some agreements that Schoology will be the primary uh, uh, learning management system. We will focus our efforts through Schoology, uh, Microsoft Teams, and PowerSchool. Uh, we do uh, recognize that there may be uh, times in which, uh, you know, our, our lead learners, our teachers out there might have a uh, need to use additional uh, supports or platforms, and we do have uh, the opportunity to evaluate those and approve those uh, as an as needed basis. And then also we, we still have in the LOA, which we had in the spring, the, the idea that everybody has to check their email a minimum of twice daily to ensure that we're we're getting effective communication uh, across the school site. Let me kind of roll into the agreement that we have on the um, special education front. Generally, the overwhelming majority of special educators are teachers of record, so they will follow, in essence, the same schedule, obviously with a modified curriculum, but with the same expectations that we have for the general education teachers. The itinerant staff, the staff that may not be teachers of record, will continue to support our students through distance learning. That can include teletherapy, where practical, i.e. our speech therapists engaging, engaging in speech therapy over through a device. Uh, that's just one example. And or parent training. Um, something that's new, we did come to an agreement on one-to-one -one assessments. One-to-one -one assessments are those assessments special educators have to provide uh, as part of a three-year update or an initial evaluation to determine eligibility. Last year, in-person assessments were suspended. That is not the case this year. So students will actually be going into our school sites on an appointment basis uh, to receive their required ass assessments. And obviously, we'll take proper safety protocol to make sure that we have some uh, things in place to ensure the safety of our students and our staff. Mr. Godot, next slide. Um, another key component of the uh, LOA was the updated distance learning plans that will occur within the four, first 45 days of school and added to the IEP document. As a result of the, of the pandemic and distance learning, California required that staff engage and create what's called distance learning plans with families. This outlines the agreement on what goals and objectives and services will be targeted during distance learning. Uh, special education teachers will also complete a log of contacts and uh, registers to ensure that we document the services that we provide. We also came to agreement on a number of uh, vital teachers who may not be teachers of record. I'm just going to give you an example, counselors, coaches, um, uh, intervention center teachers. I apologize for the abbreviation. But on top of their uh, relevant duties that are on their job descriptions, we're going to have the counselors and actually the psychologists too man the social emotional hotline a minimum of two hours per week. Intervention center teachers are going to focus on issues surrounding equity and ensuring that our students are logging in and getting the support we need them to get. The multi-tiered system of support coaches will assist with our teachers with distance learning um, and uh, work with the uh, curriculum and instruction professional development uh, office to that end. The computer literacy teachers will assist with will assist with distance learning also at the same kind of be the kind of be that point of contact at each one of our elementary sites to ensure that the the teachers who don't have as much experience get some experience and some expertise. The prep providers at the K-6 level will work on social emotional character lessons that they can deliver to the teachers so that they could use those in their 15 minute check ins or at various times throughout the day. And then the instructional coaches and coordinators, I talked about the MTSS coaches, but I believe uh, Dr. Odell is going to talk about her plan on how she wants to use um, the other coaches and coordinators in a, in, in a later slide. Um, we also came to agreement on health and safety elements. This includes regular cleaning of workspaces, PPE made available to those teachers who do not opt to bring in their own, obviously the enforcement of social distancing requirement, hand sanitizer in every class, 
health sanitizers and them being familiar with the de with the site and district expectations regarding safety is. Um, it's also important to note though, however, that we are not currently in a, a, a lockdown situation. I'm sorry, I'm not using the right term on lockdown, but individuals still can come onto our campuses. And so uh, as long as we stay in the same situation we're in right now, we will allow students to attend on campus through appointments so that uh, uh, various activities can occur. Again, keeping in mind all health and safety protocols and standards. Okay. So for substitutes, uh, we did come to the agreement that we're going to follow all of our established call-in procedures for substitutes. So if a, for example, if a teacher uh, is uh, gone through the interactive process at HR and they're working remotely from home, um, then they would still need to call in if they were going to be sick. They can't just, you know, send out a message to students and say, hey, everybody, just do this today and I'll check in with you tomorrow. There still will be a substitute and a lesson plan uh, required to engage in that work with the, the students for the day. Uh, subs will get the video conferencing links that they need to engage with those students. Um, of concern was the idea that uh, that employees might be asked to share usernames and passwords to, to facilitate getting in and out of platforms, and that's obviously a big no-no, so uh, that is outlined in the LOA as well. Uh, and we're working to provide the, the training that our substitutes are going to need in order to access those platforms, as well as when they check in at school sites, they'll receive a computer uh, to get that work done for the day. Uh, and like I just mentioned, they will be, subs will be reporting to the school site uh, to, do, to engage in the, the substitute teaching responsibilities. So stipends are outlined. Uh, any and all stipends are dependent on principal approval. Really, it's this idea that, um, you know, the work has to be able to be done before we look at whether or not those stipends are going to be paid. So that's going to be an ongoing conversation throughout the school year for any number of different subs or excuse me, stipends. Um, uh, I think oftentimes we associate stipends with with coaching positions, but we also have any number of uh, co and extracurricular activities from mock trial uh, to science Olympiad to uh, yearbook and cheer and any number of different things that that teachers engage in. Uh, the idea being here is, is we don't want to get uh, super restrictive. We want to create uh, opportunities for staff to connect with students. As I mentioned last week, that is a, a critical area, particularly when we are in distance uh, learning that we're still connecting with students. Uh, so we'll take those on a case by case basis. And then uh, professional development through and with uh, curriculum instruction and professional development. Uh, we have stated that to the extent possible, basically everything that we're doing with staff is going to be online. Uh, unless there is um, an absolute necessity to bring people together physically present uh, in rooms. And if we did that, we are going to employ all of the different requirements of social distancing, uh, appropriate, you know, everybody in a face mask, hand sanitizer, all that. But the message here is, is everything is everything is virtual unless we add, there is a definite need to bring folks together. So as Mr. Herbst mentioned that we are not currently in shelter in place, but it's also important that we're preparing for the possibility. It's not outside the realm of possibility, particularly in our area and our county uh, where we have an uptick, an uptick in uh, COVID positive cases. So we are communicating with sites around uh, getting their staff ready in case we get to that spot. The district will communicate out to our school community in the case of a shelter in place where uh, employees right now in distance learning would not report to work in shelter in place. Uh, sites would communicate then to staff and students, hey, this is what that looks like. The idea being here that we want a seamless transition. If Monday we're in distance learning and the county officer comes on and announces or the governor announces we're in shelter in place Tuesday, we will start and flow seamlessly into distance learning through that different work environment. Uh, so we're making those uh, arrangements at the school site and that planning, namely, you know, making sure that staff have what they need when they leave at the end of the day to, to continue their work. Um, and how, again, like we did in the spring, how would we communicate and, you know, transfer phones and who's going to answer what lines, those kinds of things. Again, the goal here is a seamless transition. So with that, um, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Odell. Well, thank you, Brad. Um, 
I get the pleasure of sharing with you, uh, following Mr. Herps and Mr. Godot, on what curriculum and instruction and professional development is doing to support this uh, distance learning, this time where we aren't um, allowed to bring our students back. So we've got um, quite a bit of work going on, as, as you can well imagine, with our TK-12 distance learning teacher supports. That includes, we're going to continue to coach teachers and support them. We have curriculum pacing coming out with all the recommendations of what uh, teachers should be hitting week by week in every grade level and every content area. We have uh, templates that we've provided to help them create their lessons in a gradual release of responsibility um, mode. And we've got lots and lots of ed tech training coming and supports and recommendations, what apps they can use to encourage speaking and listening and reading and writing together. We also have uh, coaching office hours for any teacher who uh, feels like they need more direct support from a coach. We have content newsletters that will be um, regularly sent out for different content areas. We also have professional development that is not part of um, the tentative 0.5 um, compensa compensation initiative because we've got lots of new teachers and they, they need um, to know how to use our curriculum and um, to know about our assessments and those types of things. Of course, we still have SWAN, and um, as we've expanded uh, the sites that use SWAN, we've got a lot of training to do to ensure that they understand the curriculum and can use it to the best of their ability. Brad, can you switch the slide, please? Did you see? I had, is it frozen? Uh, it froze for a second, but I got it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I do want you to know uh, what we're doing regarding English learners. Uh, it's very near and dear to my heart that we are ensuring the most supports that we can for our vulnerable language speakers. Uh, and there's also a lot of state and federal expectations still that have not gone away even in this scenario. We still are required to assess our students, so we're working out how to do that safely and effectively for all involved. We're still required to redesignate our students and monitor students students for academics and behavior and um, and, uh, and attendance that they're they're showing up online. We're still required to have our district English language um, accountability community and the site English language accountability. Senate Bill 98 requires us to continue, as we should, with our integrated and designated ELD. So again, we're working through all of these things. We're going to continue using the curriculum that we have, that we've uh, adopted and we have set forth in motion. And of course, we are uh, looking carefully at how we translate, interpret it, and interpret for uh, our families that need this vital information in their home language. We will continue, like I said before, with our District English Learner Advisory Committee, and uh, we're going to have those meetings. We already had our first meeting, and we will continue to each month. Uh, and uh, actually, next time that we meet, uh, we intend to bring to you what I like to call the State of the Union for English Learners for our district. And hopefully, we'll be able to bring you a lot more information about the work that was done last year and leading into this year. That's still all moving forward, even in this uh, virtual time. And of course, we're training all of our sites to think outside the box how they might still be able to hold their virtual meetings and support students. We've created all the supports that they need. It's just now a matter of them reaching out to the families with our help and um, getting them involved so we can still meet those requirements because we want parents to be informed, we wanna hear their voice, and we want them a part of the decision-making that we have. I wanted you to know that we've been working very, very carefully with Brad's team and uh, Russ Selkin's team on identifying the students that do not have um, internet. So last uh, May and June, 
we had identified the students that were struggling. So that meant we were providing them with hard copies rather than the digital um, access because they were still struggling with internet for various types of reasons. Um, and right now we've moved from, there were about 400 students, English learners that had, had a difficulty getting online at the end of the year. And we've um, been able to support them and help them. And right now we've narrowed that down to about 170 families that still report that they're having some kind of difficulty, or they may be a new family to the area and, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, they just haven't been able to make that phone call. Some of them, maybe their landlord doesn't allow them to to have the, the internet set up and the cable company come onto the to their property. So there's all kinds of different reasons why this is happening and we're working through that for that equity and access. The other neat thing is we have um, about 500 refugee students in our, our system now. And that, that number's actually almost doubled because the federal government has changed the guidelines on um, uh, the years, the length of time that someone can be in the country and be considered a refugee. So we're working on supporting them. We are going to be contacting every single family and student on an ongoing basis to ensure that they're getting what they need and they have the supports to continue their academic journey with us in a robust way. And um, so it's very, very important to our team that we're working on that. Um, I did want to share with you that the team, uh, the curriculum instruction, professional development, the coaches and the court coordinators in conjunction with Russ Salkin's team, we've really been working on ensuring that teachers have what they what they need or learn what they don't know yet in terms of launching distance learning. So we have been creating um, templates and resources that that um, are also grade appropriate in grade bands like K2, uh, 3, 6, and 7, 12 on what students need to do. So students need to know how to be able to log onto Schoology. Students need to know how to be able to upload their assessments when the teacher requires something uploaded. So we've been providing uh, scripts and video to teach the teachers and the students how to do this. Um, there may be teachers that don't need our support. They know how to train their kids in that, and that's great. They don't have to use our supports. But if there's a teacher that's new to our system and doesn't really know Schoology yet, um, they can just hit play on the video and learn with their students too and um, get through the same expectations of distance learning and that skill set they need. Uh, TK12, we have that ready to go for, for our families. Um, we will be doing diagnostic assessments. We need to know where our kids uh, came from this last year, or what their learning needs are to move forward with them. And all of this will be uh, provided to parents in a very robust parent communication plan we have ready to go forward. Again, like I was saying with this, this first four weeks, we have all of these resources. Um, we're gonna take them through this gradual release of responsibility where the teacher does it, and that's the I do, and then week two, everybody does it together, that's the we do. Week three is a little more gradual release where you do this together and let me watch you and I'll coach you. It's just very much like that coaching where you, you model it and then you step back slowly so that the, um, the player can do it themselves. And then in week four, TK12, all of our all of our um, students uh, will have this skill set for distance learning um, to use if and when and as they need it. Lastly, I wanted to share with you, um, it get, of course, it's still tentative, but we've been making our plan for professional development. Should it be ratified and approved by the board? Um, we've been creating these virtual libraries uh, to support folks um, on really two buckets this year, and Dr. Noguchi has talked about it, the diversity, the race and social justice, this, this idea that um, we must address equity and access for all of our students. And um, so that, that's the first real big bucket of work that, that we're doing with our um, staff classified management and certificated. And then the second bucket is like what I've explained to you, this distance learning, ensuring that the teachers have the skill set they need for all types of technological learning. Always remembering that pedagogy, great pedagogy is our focus. Technology is the um, is a vehicle to provide 
great pedagogy. It's not so much about the technology as it is about great learning. And then it happens to be that we're doing great learning right now online. So there's a set of skills that we have to provide our students for that. And this still comes in with this idea of the social and emotional and the supports that we provide our students. Uh, I've been working with Mr. Herbst on um, an online uh, video library where folks can learn how to work through social emotional through the screen through the distance learning, how do they set up their routines? How do they um, work and, and meet the needs of the kids even when we're not face to face, but we're, we're in the uh, online together, our scholars. So those are all the things, um, just a few of the things that we're working on in CIPD to ensure that we have the, the best um, that we can provide our community and our scholars with um, distance learning right now. Thank you, Brad. Mr. Gano, you're uh, you're still muted. Yeah, Perfect. I was going to say, yeah. Next you're steps, gonna... yes. Next <laughs> steps, we're going to continue to outreach over the next two weeks uh, to families regarding the internet connect connectivity. Uh, we're going to be distributing devices that started today uh, over the next week. We've got teacher and support uh, and training happening district-wide on August 4th, 5th, and 6th, as well as monitoring and supporting uh, our vulnerable populations as Dr. Odell pointed out. So I know that I recognize that was a long presentation, a lot of information, uh, but we are happy to take your questions, et cetera. Okay, yes. Now I am not sure, but Mr. Oh, I see uh, Trustee West has a question. All right, Trustee West, are you ready? Uh, yes, yes. First of all, wow. I cannot even imagine how much work went into figuring out all of these little details. You guys have thought of, well, you probably haven't thought of everything, but that will come up. But it seems like you are covering all the bases. And I just appreciate all the work from the team that went into this. Thank you so, so much. Um, I had a couple of questions. The curriculum pacing that was talked about is this going to coordinate with the pacing for the virtual academy? And the reason I'm asking this is because I want to know if students begin the first term, which is going to be a semester or a trimester, I believe, um, if they begin it with the virtual academy and then at the end of the term, they want to switch back to the distance learning, is that going to be pretty seamless in their education or how, how easy will this be for our students to make that transition? Uh, Trustee Dr. West, this is uh, Brad. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. Um, there, there is the potential for some bumps in the road in a transition at, at, grade, uh, at the end of a grading period. We talked a little bit about that last week, but that is one of the things that we do outline for parents uh, when they enroll. Um, there, there are some issues. There, there aren't always you know, perfect crossover courses. Um, so yeah, it, it can be a bit bumpy. Uh, the idea at the beginning was that this would be a year long but we also recognize that there, there may be a necessity uh, to change students' uh, placement at the grade, end of the grade span. Okay, and that makes sense, thank you. Um, and then the second question I have is concerning learning pods. I've been reading about those and hearing about those and a lot of parents are interested in getting um, small groups of students together, socially distancing, wearing masks, but kind of students working together either with a tutor or with a parent, sometimes with a teacher. Are we going to have anything to do with learning pods or is that kind of strictly up to parents to organize those? So let, let me respond to that. Um, I know that that's out in the media a lot, especially in the Bay Area and, and to some degree down in um, Southern California. In Stanislaw County in the last 10 days, we've had 240 kids diagnosed positive with COVID. And over the course since um, March, we've had 680. It was um, told to us today that we do not want to bring kids together unless it is outside and for a real need. So meaning you need to get your computer, you need to do your assessment because you're special ed, but bringing kids together um, as a school, that's not something that we are going to do until after our positive rate um, is 
is decreased to a significant um, amount. Okay, and that makes sense. Thank you. And again, thank you for all of the hard work, everyone. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Now to Trustee Newman. Uh, thank you, team. Um, I want to echo Dr. West's comments of thanking everybody. This is um, amazing work. Uh, and I, I've been following it closely because I've you know, got an anxious senior. Um, so the, uh, just, um, take that off now, but I have been, you can't see it. Trustee, we can hear you trustee. Um, I mean, <laughs> superintendent, go ahead, trustee Newman. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, so the, uh, the question I had, uh, was I'm getting this from students. Um, are you going to be using teams or zoom? Uh, it looked like teams based on the report, but I, I want to confirm that. Yes, it is teams that will be the primary uh, conferencing, but there, there are also some adjustments that have been made to Schoology video conferencing as well that have been upgraded over the summer. So the direct instruction can either be queued in Schoology or it can be live, right? Correct. That's correct. Okay. So some of the, the, you know, a teacher may only give one lecture um, a day for, you know, the history, the history lecture a day, and that could be queued and the students could access it um, when they, during any time or would they need to access it during their class time? No, teachers will need to provide the direct instruction during the specific period of that instructional uh, schedule during the day. Now, okay. a, teacher, a teacher may screencast it, meaning record them, record themselves say first period providing the lecture then they could play that later in the day in a different period or even the next day um, but there is a requirement that the teacher is still engaging with the students during that time we can't just press a recording and then go check out okay and um then i know we address counselors and and what we're doing trying to put people um, everybody's got to kind of wear different hats and and to serve the needs of our students i appreciate that work that's been done that was that's difficult um uh one of them that was i i didn't see anything specifically was college counselors and is there a plan with regard to the college counselors that are at each of our high school sites it wasn't separated great question it wasn't separated specifically to college counselors i will tell you truthfully even in a distance learning format there's a lot of work done by our counselors just in terms of um, attempting to meet with large numbers of kids from a distance learning format so it was a heavy lift the one thing though that we've agreed to engage in uh, 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 trustee newman is a re-engagement on some of those groups with whom we want to look to make sure that either a we've addressed uh, all the duties that, that we think are applicable b to also get a sense of what the workload is for those individuals once the dust settles so college counselors are lumped in with the counselors on top of their their typical their typical job related duties but it'll be something that we relook at once the dust settles and the school starts yeah i because there there's certain things that they need to be doing with each of the seniors during sure. this period of time before november 30th um, the end of most app, the, the yep. end of the bulk of the application season. Um, okay. Um, and then Wednesdays, what what should be the expectations of a parent to with regard to if you have a third grade student on Wednesdays? What 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 should I expect as a parent of how long my my child will be in school? Oh. That day? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take this question. What well, Wednesday does not have the prescribed regimented schedule as we talked about before. So this is a golden opportunity for our teachers to be able to provide some differentiated instruction for some of our students who may not be accessing distance learning and or struggling with the content. So I guess you could say it would probably depend on the individual child. I could see a child who may be performing close to or at grade level after the check-in, getting assigned work and being able to do to work independently and then check back in with the teacher. That person wouldn't have nearly as much face time as potentially uh, Mark Hurst in the back of the room who's struggling with some of the math content. I could then engage in a much, much more targeted reteach or pre-teach uh, uh, some of the lessons that are coming. So Wednesday, 
whereas it's pretty regimented, that Wednesday is a little bit more nebulous. Um, but on the flip end of it, I do think it allows us to get a little bit more prescribed with some of our um, 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 students who typically struggle. Okay. So should the parents plan that their student has to be, their child has to be, you know, signed in? Are we che We're checking attendance that day. We're checking attendance every day. Absolutely. So I'm just trying, parents are asking me questions and I'm trying to like kind of explain, okay, this will be the day. This will how it'll be going. Uh, uh, Trustee Newman, I would say that the, 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 the simplest answer to that is students are expected to be engaged from the start of the day, uh, which at TK6 is going to be 8.30 a.m. to the conclusion of the day at 3 p.m. We're okay. responsible for accounting for what those uh, learning activities and instructional activities are throughout the day. There may be times, uh, depending on the day of the week and the time of the, the instructional block, where students might be expected to be working independently, um, but that isn't to, to think that they can log out and go you know, on a trip or leave for the day. They're, they, they really are attending through the entire school day, so to speak. That's great. Good clarification. Thank you. That's it. Those are all my questions for tonight. Thanks. <laughs> okay, thank you. Those were good. All right, I have Trustee Walker and then Trustee Irvin. All right. So much for Wednesday field trips. <laughs> um, Mark, I can help you with the math thing in the back of the classroom later. <laughs> Um, my rule, and again, to, if folks don't realize the difference between now and what we were in the fall, take a step back at all the work because we talked about it last week. It's amazing. It's we all agree. A um, couple of notes I took. One goes back to sort of Mark on the uh, special ed. You talked about documentation procedural changes, and my first thought there when I saw that was. That actually looks like a best practice that should be incorporated for time memorial. Does mm -hmm. that make sense in your world? It does. I mean, a spe well, first off, just the documentation is always essential to, to demonstrate what we're doing to reach out to our families. But the distance learning plan, and I think that's what you're referring to, really is that agreement when, when we reach out to the family that, hey, we recognize that we can't replicate exactly what we do. However, we have agreed as a team to target the following goals and objectives, services that we can provide, and here's what we're going to do. It provides focus to those providers, and I think it provides meaning to those families as well. They, they instituted the DLP, the distance learning plan, at the end of last year. It was very successful. I'm looking forward to it being successful this year as well. It just really seems like what you would call a real foundation sort of for building that relationship between the student, the family, and us that avoids what we've seen in the last, at least I've seen in the last five years, where there's a disconnect. Yeah. And this, to me, certainly sounds like something that's a byproduct of distant learning, but really does reinforce structurally what is a core concept of doing IEPs and special ed. Correct. And so that, to me, was encouraging. Um, I'm going to leave seamless transition alone because we've got that. Everybody else is giving me whiplash. Um, as soon as I get health care coverage, I'll get treated. Um, the Schoology thing, and then here's the question that's come up because I've logged on. I've got my kids account. It's two weeks out. When do we find out what the schedule is? I can't see as a parent what classes my students in, what the teachers are. And in previous years, we would have already picked up textbooks. You know, the source program at Enox, which isn't going on, would be going on. And I know everybody's ramping up, but as a parent and my senior down the hall, there's no classes, no, there's nothing for us to work with two weeks out. When does that resolve? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll be happy to take that, Trustee Walker. Uh, we recognize that, that that is a challenge, but given the circumstances, we do have, uh, depending on the site, some master schedule adjustments that will need to be made as we uh, transition MBA students out of master schedules, as we're transitioning teachers that are going into MBA out of schedules uh, and making those adjustments. So. Um, yeah, I would anticipate probably the week before the, you know, next end of next week would be a target for that. There, there isn't a lot of, uh, leeway in the, the number of things that need to take place between now and August 7th, as far as getting students in the classes they need. Um, 
there will be a period of time at the start of the year where we are going to be, you know, counselors would be normally going through this, making sure students are in the classes that they need. If there's any scheduling issues or uh, stuff like that, there will be uh, protocols in place at sites around who does the student or the family contact? How do they get that time virtually with a counselor to make adjustments? But yeah, uh, that that is frustrating. I could I can see as a parent, currently parent, right, looking for class schedules, but recognize that there are a number of different uh, machinations that need to take place over the next two weeks that we just can't. Um, we we would be communicating a lot of change schedules, let's say, uh, if we needed to do that now. I understand. I just know that it's not just me as a parent. I've also got the senior student who's trying to figure out sort of what happened to electives, because mm -hmm. certain electives aren't going to be adaptable to distance learning in a sense that if you were somebody that was doing a CTE welding or framework, or you're clearly not welding in the backyard. And so there's got to be adjustments to all of that. And so that's out of my little personal circle, but I know folks are thinking about it and we're certainly looking to see what the schedule looks like so that we can adjust and help. And right. I'll figure out how to do the Schoology thing later. We've got power school. It's not telling me anything. But that's okay. You're well, working I, on it. I do, Trustee Walker. I do want to address the comment about uh, if an elective will be in the master schedule. Uh, as I mentioned uh, at a previous board meeting, it might have been last week even, that uh, we are our approach has been those classes that were in the master schedule when we broke for summer uh, are going to be in the master schedule, provided that we've got the staffing there. So we're not eliminating any courses uh, strictly on. Uh, because it's hands on and now it's going to be distance learning. We've got to rethink how we do that with very creative professionals, but we don't want to eliminate the opportunities for students to learn about those, the, the welding and ag and all of those, you know, hands on CTE courses. So um, it'll be a challenge, but we're up for it. No, I just, it's one of those things that's sticking out right now is we're, because we're watching the clock just like you are. And so, and I'm sure I'm not asking you questions any different than anybody else out there trying to figure out who's on first and second. So for parents out there, we don't have any inside information. Um, the only other comment I had was, and I guess it's a judgment call. And you talked about people bringing in their own PPE. When you were talking about Mark, maybe on this one-on-one -on -one assessment idea, the only thing that makes me nervous about that is if your PPE was laying in the truck or it was laying on the couch or on the floor and you brought it into a classroom, is that really where we wanna be versus providing something that we know is righteous? And I don't yeah. know if that needs an answer right now, but it's certainly something I think about when I see people drag the mask off the dashboard or off the gear shift lever or mom picking the mask up off the floor or the concrete as they're walking into the store with Cheetos all over it. <laughs> you get you get my get. This, I do. You know what I'm saying? Point taken. Yeah, point taken. Definitely. It's just something I think is worth looking at. And then I've got nothing else. Great job. And I'll keep watching for the class list. All right, thank you, Trustee Walker. Then I have Trustee Irvin, Trustee Brown, and then Trustee Lopez. All right. You yes. Trustee Irvin, um, right? Yes. Uh, the question I had, um, uh, one of them actually, Trustee Walker got answered for me about the schedule. But the other one I had is, you know, we got, we got um, telehealth, telecommute, tele-everything right now. Um, do we have tele-tutor? for access for our, for our students that may need uh, extra assistance and, you know, can have access to a tutor uh, or a paraprofessional or, you know, um, um, through via, via um, you know, online, you know, so they can get the extra help that they, they need. I know it's supplemental services providing for that and um, how, how are we dealing with, with that issue? I'll take this one and just to start it off, uh, the paraprofessionals will get devices. So yeah, they'll be available to assist our students. But on the flip end of it, and I'll look forward to sharing with this with the board, either in a communication or a formal presentation, Superintendent Noguchi has charged me with developing an after school intervention program and or supports and services. So um, there's a number of people that are working on that, some interdepartmental uh, collaboration. I look forward to discussing that, but I think that was a very, very good point in terms of how we meet the needs of some of our kids that have been struggling. So yes, a, a, a plan to come. Okay. Uh, again, I just wanna uh, reiterate the other uh, trustees and their, um, um, uh, their kudos for, you know, you would think this was a contingency plan that we were putting into place 
uh, that had been developed maybe, you know, some years back. But um, you guys really uh, made things happen. You know, you made this plan. I know it's still unfolding and we still have yet to, um, you know, still, still have yet to come to see how this um, unfolds all the way out. But I, I think you've really done a really great job in um, coming together as a team to, to make sure that our students and our teachers and our families um, have as, as minimal of disruption of their uh, educational um, lives as possible, you know, as, as humanly possible at this point in time. So I, I really commend you on that. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right, uh, Trustee Irvin, on to Trustee Brown. And then those of you that have your hands up, would you please lower them so I know you're not still planning to speak? Thank you. All right, Trustee Brown. Yes, I've got a couple of questions, but first of all, as we move into education redefined, thanks to our entire team for all the effort. Um, first question that came to mind had to do with assignments and homework and testing, and we've got new methodology for every grade level so that we can uh, do appropriate assessments. I want to make sure that we are uh, sensitive with the homework assignments, given the fact that we've got parents trying to guide students on computers and they're going to be allocating a huge chunk of their day and possibly having to do their own distance uh, employment. Uh, I wanna make sure we're not overly heavy on homework that's going to require additional parent time that isn't available. So I want to make sure that we're real sensitive to uh, parent uh, time frames as well as the student time frames. Um, so has there been any uh, discussion about how much homework and out, uh, assignments outside of the, uh, the logged in class time? There there has not been specific discussions about the amount of time, but to your point, um, and I and I don't have the LOA open right in front of me, but it really does talk about the idea of homework being assigned for review of skills taught. So I, I and I know I don't think this quite gets to everything you want uh, that what you're referencing, uh, 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 Trustee Brown, but it really is more homework for practice purposes to where we wouldn't be taking a lot of t uh, parent time attempting to reteach content to the children. So again, I, I I hear what you're saying about hey that may not get to the minutes, but at least it spells out the fact that the homework is supposed to be review of of of, of, of skills that a child should be able to do independently. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I just want to make sure that we're sensitive to the time that parents are having sure. to put in. Yep. Um, so the next question that I have, uh, you know, our focus is getting students back in classrooms. And as soon as that's possible, I'm curious what kind of carryover we're going to have from this experience. I see that we're uh, thrusting technology on all of our students very rapidly. Do we have the intent of that uh, personal device going into uh, or with the student back to the classroom so that they can now take advantage of what they've learned in technology with the distance learning? Uh, Trustee Brown, uh, this is Brad, I'll, I'll take that. I, I think that depending on the grade level, the grade span, uh, would probably dictate to some extent how often the device might travel back and forth. Uh, before we broke, uh, before we knew we were heading into distance learning, we were having that conversation, um, recognizing whether it was a hybrid model or, or some other uh, form of, of instruction in this time period. Um, so I, I guess the answer to that would be, it would depend on the grade level. Having a TK or K coming back and forth every day with the device might not be the best. Um, but if you had a specific day of the week for them to bring in a device to, to further engage and learn more and, and utilize, um, that was the direction we're going. So uh, I think you're on to something there. That's definitely something teachers would be considering. Thank you. And the fact that that device is in the home and that the whole family is receiving instruction on technology 
is a real valuable educational tool that uh, we need to recognize. So, uh, you know, there there is always the silver lining on the dark cloud and uh, so many opportunities that we have for parent education and technology training. So hoping that we can really take advantage of that and move forward in some unusual directions. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Trustee Brown. Trustee Lopez. Yeah, hi. First of all, I want to say thank, thanks to everyone that um, did the, the report and thanks uh, to everyone for doing the great turnaround. Uh, I like to put out the example that, I mean, last week we were having the conversation around the lunches and this week we, 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 we solved it, right? And you guys probably solved it Tuesday, 8 a.m. in the morning. Um, so that just shows how, how great of a work you guys are doing. Um, uh, one of my questions was answered, which was around tutoring. Definitely want to have an after school uh, version program um, that gives extra help to our students. My other question is, as we get closer to the uh, to the starting date, those 170 students, what what kind of options are we thinking if we can't get landlords or we can't get um, uh, uh, internet providers out to the homes? What are we thinking with knowing that maybe uh, paper is, paper uh, options is not going to work? And because we're thinking um, now now teachers are going to be um, connecting with with uh, with students, right? We we want that them to be a part of that as well. Let's have Russ um, or Mr. Salkin answer that one. Mr. Salkin, are you here? Yes. Um, first of all, I guess I'll take it to the nth degree where we have a long procedure and steps to help get them connected to viable internet services. And I think we mentioned that on the last call as well as getting them cost effective because they have this thing in California called internet essentials. So it's $10 a month. Um, we give them a pre-qualification letter. So there's different scenarios you're talking about. One would be if those carriers aren't in that area, we have a process where we'll look at it from a technical perspective. And then um, if we can't get a typical carrier, we'll give them a, what they call an LTE or a hotspot option for them to use. And so that's the other option that we have available for the students and the parents. And I don't know if you're talking about if there's ever, we haven't ran into a situation where the common carrier is not an option nor the LTE light. Um, I don't think we uh, will see that, but if we did fall into a situation where there was none of those technologies available, then what you kind of alluded to, we'd have to work through more of a traditional kind of paper strategy and structure form. But so far we haven't ran into any parents or families that have said that. Yeah, no, my, my concern was as uh, I believe Ms. O uh, Odell brought up of uh, some parents can't, their landlords aren't allowing uh, hardware to be installed um, and, and that's or the, uh, landlords aren't responding and what kind of other options do we have for them to still have to be uh, on the internet while without having that hardware right which which would be ideal because that provides the best um, internet options for them right that one example that I gave of the LTE hotspot that's the case where if the landlord will not let any premise changes take place, they would get this uh, hotspot. But it is, we are pushing them towards the traditional carrier because of a number of reasons. And one of them is not only budget for us, um, and then also the fact that the performance on those LT isn't the same as a common carrier with cable modems and things like that. But the worst case is if there's no landlord uh, ability, then we'll give them the LTE hotspot. Great, great. And a hotspot like that would work out in out in the country, or is... yeah. So far, we haven't had any, but it's not. It, there's different various what they call bandwidth or speeds, but so far we haven't run into a scenario where that wasn't at least an option for them to be able to use that. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. That's great because that's been a question by a lot of board members throughout the state on connectivity. So that's really helpful that what well, the access that we have. I was talking to a family member and he was reminding me that we used to have modems and we used to have that eek sound when we all logged in. So um, I thought, well, if we don't have the towers, maybe we could do <laughs> modems if you all remember that. <laughs> anyway, so different now. But 
Thank you for that, Russ. That was really helpful, um, Mr. Siskin. Thank you, uh, Sul Sulkin. Sorry. Um, appreciate that. All right. Next, I have okay, and then I have a question. Um, I so on the schedule. When I looked at the schedule uh, for elementary school, you said I believe it starts at eight thirty and ends at three, and then high school starts at nine fifteen, ends at two thirty. I was like, wow, big difference in high school schedule. So I was wondering about getting the minutes in uh, for our students. So I don't know if you have that screen. I don't know what number it was, but it was the two charts, the elementary yes. and high school charts. Yes. Trustee Marks, give me a moment. I can I can put that back up. Okay. I have a I have another question too. Got it there. So okay. uh, right. from here in the high in the seven twelve schedule, uh, this zero and eighth period also factors in. Um, but just these three periods uh, are such big blocks, 80 minutes per, that gives us 240 um, by themselves. Um, as far as the TK6 daily instructional schedule, um, I'd have to go back and, and do the minutes calculation, but between the, the digital break and the lunch, um, there's, there's a sufficient number of minimum instructional minutes. Okay, because because it looks like the day is starting later than we used to for especially for high school and ending at the same time 230. So I was trying to figure out how we got the amount of minutes in and I, so that must mean that the breaks are shorter. So I see it's a five minute break yeah. uh, after lunch between the two periods and then um, in the morning it's a 15 minute break. So that's about what they used to take. So I just was trying to figure out how that worked. Um, oh no, it's 9.15 to 10.35, there aren't any breaks. Okay, so all right, I guess that explains it. The breaks are shorter. I just wanted to make sure that our students had the amount of instruction that they were needing to complete all that they needed in school. Okay. All right, thank you. It looks like I have two more. I think Trustee West brought her question back up and then I have Trustee Irvin and then Trustee Lopez. Is that what I have? Okay, Trustee West. Thank you. Um, I just had one more quick question I had for, I forgot. Um, I've had a lot of parents who are trying to decide whether to go the virtual academy or the distance learning. And so, um, just a scenario, if a parent starts with a distance learning and then schools open back up at some point and the parent is not quite ready for the student to come back to campus, what are the options? Well, the option would be for the trimester or semester. Right. The option would be that they could uh, add their name to the list for Modesto Virtual Academy. Um, but uh, that, that's about where that would be. Uh, any any mid-year adjustment depending on uh, any number of factors, but students wanting to come back from MBA to uh, distance learning or whatever that is at that time. Um, but we we I, I, I wouldn't foresee a, a, a free flowing back and forth of uh, that process. It's just it's just we can't accommodate all that. But we are tracking uh, the MBA requests now, and so that that is we get a date and a timestamp when uh, families are going in and uh, using that link to indicate interest. So that's that's about as best as I can answer that right now. I think that's totally understandable. I just the parents that I've spoken with are just, you know, they're on the fence. They're just not sure which is the best way to go. And that's understandable because no one can tell what the future is going to be. So all right, thank you. I appreciate that. OK, I have Trustee Irvin and then Trustee Walker. Um, yes, this, I'm going back to the, uh, the tutoring again. I, I know we're going to have thousands of students who uh, who are going to be doing the, you know, both distance learning and virtual academy. Is there any way or possibility to create opportunities for some of our, our, our students to serve as as tutors, you know, maybe provide some professional development to them and create opportunities, I don't know, maybe through CTE or stipend to um, help them um, become tutors to their, their their peers and you know some of the junior high elementary schools that they can maybe maybe help 
um, you know, I'm just thinking, thinking out loud and thinking about the mass of the numbers of students that's going to be need, maybe need help um, and trying to deploy maybe some future teachers who, who, you know, may have teacher on their mind, you know, at this juncture, maybe getting some exposure or something like that. I don't know, maybe create some opportunities for some of our students to give back as well. Just a thought. Great idea. All right, thank you, Trustee Irvin. Trustee, um, let's see, wait, who was Walker? <laughs> Sorry, Lopez took his off. Trustee Walker. I just wanted to piggyback off of sort of been listening to everybody and sort of listening, piggybacking off of what Trustee Brown talked about with homework time and mentioned assessments. The other part of this that I really haven't focused in on, and I don't think it's part of this particular agenda item, but maybe the next meeting or so. What is the plan as far as coming back with a distance learning approach to assess how much has been lost with our students between the shutdown last year and coming back this year and getting back to grade level? Because to me, that's a tricky process in a one on one situation in a classroom where you actually have a teacher being able to do sort of effective, you know, question answer assessments versus the online version versus what does it take to figure out what that slippage was and how do we get back to grade level? I have a hard time believing that we didn't lose steps. I don't think anybody's questioning that, certainly at the state level as to what happened at the end of the year. But, you know, is that something we could look at down the road here as we get into the opening year? Where are we really at compared to where we were when all this started and what ground needs to get made up to get back to even? If that makes sense. Dr. So, uh, Trustee Walker, this is um, Dr. Gucci. Um, that that is part of the plan as far as assessing um, both learning loss and where kids are at. I do know that one of the my goals that that, that was set together uh, collectively back in May. I think it's goal number two, and that is um, mm -hmm. English and math pre and post test. So we're going to take a look at where kids have where where kids have started. I also recognize, and, and then obviously where kids end up. Um, I do know that we have diagnostic assessments that um, CIPD have um, worked to create. Um, SWAN has also um, developed for the math um, elementary level diagnostics to be able to identify the, the holes. We will have a whole other presentation on this because this is bigger than a quick question. It's much bigger than that, but we will come back to you on um, what we've done, what we found, and then uh, what we will uh, be moving forward as a result of it. And that makes perfect sense, which is sort of what I was getting at, is it, it may not apply to this presentation, but it's certainly got to be a big piece of what's sitting out there to sort of, you know, get a grip on where we were, where we are, where we're going, and we're still missing all the state assessments because they were canceled, and I have no doubt they're going to try to throw them back over the fence this year. It's on the agenda, it's on your radar, good enough for me. Okay, so that concludes the uh, questions from the board members. Uh, Ms. Noonan, do we have any comments from the public? Um, no, not on this item. Okay, thank you very much. So we are going to have a, take a 10 minute break and we're going to put a clock on the screen so that you will know when we will resume the next meeting. All right, it's gonna be for 10 minutes. We'll see you back in 10 minutes.
Yes. All right, welcome back everybody. Glad we have the timer. It just helps us know how much time we have. Now we are on to item B3, the report on and approval. So we'll be voting on this one of services agreement with the Center for Human Services to provide student assistance specialist program and general education counseling service, family support specialist program and refugee case manager for 2020 2021 school year and Ms. Hinkle is going to be giving this report. Uh, if you don't mind, I just want to say a couple words. First off, that may have been one of the longest titles in the history of uh, <laughs> MCS, but either way, yeah, uh, Senior Director of Student Support Services, Daniel Hinkle is going to do this presentation. I just really, before we get started, I want to publicly acknowledge the longstanding positive relationship we have with the center and their staff. Um, on the year to year, including last year, and Danielle's gonna to touch on this, they continue to exceed, meet and exceed our expectations for the social emotional support that we provide to our kids throughout this district. Um, I consider Executive Director Cindy Duenas and her staff to be top-notch people with integrity, honesty, and, and a strong, strong, strong work ethic. So in any event, Daniel Hinkle is going gonna, is gonna to share uh, 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 kind of the work that was done and the work that goes forward and hopefully uh, seek your guys' approval on the services agreement uh, with the Center for Human Services. Ms. Hinkle, take it away. All right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, good evening, Board President Marks, trustees, Superintendent Noguchi, and Cabinet members. Um, as Mark mentioned, the purpose of my presentation this evening is to highlight our relationship with the Center for Human Services and the social emotional support services that they provide. I'm going to be sharing some data that supports the successes of the programs and also share how services transitioned from brick and mortar to distance learning this past spring. And last but not least, I'll be seeking approval for the four aforementioned services agreements with the Center for the 2020-2021 school year. This report and subsequent approval of service agreements is in direct alignment with District Goal 1.4, develop a multi-tiered system of supports for all students. The Center for Human Services is a nonprofit community counseling agency. Modesto City Schools and the Center have formed a collaboration that has continued to expand over the last 30 years. The Center's primary role with Modesto City Schools is to provide much needed social emotional support for students. Even amidst school closures, CHS was instrumental in shifting the work to continue with a strong support system for our students. Our work with the center engages four different provider types. The largest number of providers comes as Student Assistance Specialist or the SAS. These support staff are assigned to support all 34 sites. Their primary role is providing tier two and tier three support to students with social and or emotional needs. Students are served either in a set number of individual sessions or in a group setting. The SAS can also provide parent trainings or presentations as determined by site administration. Our junior high and high school sites have, an addition, have had an additional SAS located in the intervention center. During brick and mortar instruction, the IC SAS is the primary person involved in de-escalation and or social emotional skill building with students. I'd like to point out, uh, this was mentioned earlier, that with this year beginning in distance learning model, the work has been refocused for the intervention center teachers and thus hiring for the intervention center SAS is currently paused. As for data, student assistant specialists served 2,384 clients last year and had more than 10,000 individual sessions. When students were in crisis, the SAS assisted by providing 379 crisis intakes. They facilitated 599 group sessions and provided over 300 classroom presentations. In addition to the student assistant specialists, the district also contracts with the Center for Mental Health Clinicians to serve targeted sites. The district utilizes a behavioral consultation model, which allows clinicians to provide individual and group counseling to a small number of tier three students. The primary role of the clinicians, however, has been to work alongside the adults in the school, whether it be administrators, teachers, and even parents on how to best identify and work with students who exhibit or have mental health challenges. Data for the behavioral consultation clinicians showed 765 hours of clinical counseling for 127 tier three students. 
They facilitated 77 crisis contacts and engaged in the combined total of 694 classroom observations with staff consultation and training. Beginning uh, this past year in 2019-20, the district contracted with the center as part of a grant through the Learning Communities for School Success Program. This grant was written to address chronic absenteeism with resources funding family support specialists at 11 targeted school sites. Under direction of the site administrative team, the family support specialists provide outreach and work directly with the family in addressing chronic absenteeism or even extreme behaviors. The work centers around family skill building and ongoing parent education and training. As some of the newest providers uh, in MCS, uh, the family support specialists hit the ground running in their work with more than 300 families and 1,061 family contacts. Work with families has a goal of troubleshooting the barriers and providing education to improve attendance or help manage difficult behaviors, both at home and at school. Family support specialists engaged in a number of trainings for parents and staff, and they have also participated in SARB meetings. Also new in 2019-20 was a grant funded contract with the center as part of the California Newcomer Education and Wellbeing or CalNew grant. Terms of the, of the grant include a refugee case manager to provide mental health, medical and educational resources and transition support as families acclimate to life in the United States. In this inaugural year, the case manager worked with a list of 302 potential refugee families across 31 Modesto City School sites. The case manager worked closely to support 20 families in their native languages from Afghanistan and Iran. Case management increased families' access to necessary resources both at school and in the community. Um, with regard to data for Center for Human Services providers and uh, as a means to help us gauge effectiveness of their services, the center conducts annual satisfaction surveys with Modesto City Schools staff, students, and families. And in the essence of time, I'm not going to read all of these from the next few slides, but I will share just a few of them. So from this slide, uh, from our school staff, 100% of our staff who responded to the survey indicated that services provided by the center is uh, having a positive impact in helping students. And then specifically on this slide uh, down near the bottom, with regard to our remote services with Center for Human Services, 99% uh, of the families indicated their student benefited and it was easy to connect with the center's providers during school closures. Uh, the surveys also include opportunities for individuals to provide comments and again, I won't read all of them, but just a few. Uh, first, from a parent, services have been very helpful. My son has made tremendous progress in his behavior. And from another parent, we are very appreciative of the services and that they can, could continue during the shutdown. Our child really benefits from the support he's given. And one more slide, again, I won't read all of it. Uh, from one staff member, Center for Human Services staff are a tremendous asset to our school in helping with mental health concerns for our students, as well as educating staff and parents about various mental health topics. And lastly, <clears throat> CHS staff supported us with an all hands on deck approach during our school closures. They conducted home visits to support students and families with distance learning and engagement. Um, in thinking about our transition to distance learning back in the spring, um, I really could not be more proud of the relationship that we had with Center for Human Services leadership staff. As schools closed, Associate Superintendent Herbs and I immediately engaged in collaborative conversations with the center to determine how the work would shift. We outlined a clear process for the providers to continue working not only with existing students on their caseloads, but also those who had previously been on a wait list and even new referrals. Uh, in many ways, they were able to work through so many students. It, it was really just was amazing how many students they were able to meet with. The center's staff also provided a layer of support with preliminary risk evaluations and they supported the MCS 
uh, it's social emotional hotline. At the end of the year, Mr. Herbst and I re-engaged with the center in an after action review to discuss challenges uh, and how we could work through those challenges as well as their successes. So I do want to just uh, share a few of the challenges and, and what we did to address those. First and foremost, there was a little bit of an issue with confidentiality when we were conducting or when the center uh, staff was conducting virtual meetings. Sometimes students were, you know, in the living room with the rest of the family there, and it really was not a confidential place to help students. So the center staff uh, worked with parents to discuss the importance of a confidential secure space and families were um, great in moving students either to another location in the home or perhaps shifting to telephone support. Another challenge that we were able to work through was uh, the center staff uses Google Voice phone numbers. They were working from home and so these Google Voice numbers were a way to protect their personal cell phone numbers, but the challenge is they come across as a blocked phone call or a blocked number. Um, so obviously there were some parents who weren't accepting those calls and as a remedy, the school staff actually called and scheduled these telephone calls with the Center for Human Services staff, letting parents know the exact uh, date and time that the call would come in, as well as the fact that it would be a blocked call uh, helped tremendously. Um, we had a few hesitations with uh, some parents with the phone or virtual meetings, especially with our younger students. They, you know, are, are you who you really say you are? You know, they just wanted to be sure. And again, this was resolved with our site administration reaching out to families to reassure them of the school's working relationship with the center, as well as encouragement to continue having their student work with providers. And then the last challenge, which was one that was very easy to remedy, is student engagement in a virtual or online setting um, is different. And so the center staff uh, adjusted sessions to be shorter in length, but more frequent in nature and, and parents really appreciated that shift. Some of our successes, um, we're, I can't tell you enough how incredibly grateful we are for the seamless transition or what seemed tri uh, seamless uh, in the services provided by the center. Uh, there were no delays to services and staff not only accommodated existing students, as I mentioned before, but were able to uh, add on additional students to their caseloads. Um, on many occasions, not only were the individual students supported by the center's staff, but the entire family. Uh, there were occasions where the entire family was learning about strategies for improved communication, for boundary setting and parent education. Um, we also had staff from the center who created some short informational wellness videos um, and those were put on for on the district website for parents to access or staff. And as mentioned before, there was an all hands on deck approach in working to support schools. Um, I'm excited to share a project that we're currently working on for this new school year, which includes um, several components. One is uh, monthly newsletters in both English and Spanish with a social, emotional, uh, mental health or wellness topic of the month. And this would be posted for all MCS families and students to view online. Uh, Center from the staff is also looking to develop an at home video series for parents. These would include topics such as how to motivate learning, strategies for challenging behavior, creating a workspace, topics along those lines. And lastly, we're also exploring the idea of having the CHS behavior clinicians host virtual coffee talks. This would be a series of live mental health um, or social emotional or wellness presentations uh, provided by CHS staff, followed by a QA, and a um, again, open to the entire Modesto City Schools community. So we're pretty excited about these um, new expansions uh, of their services during school closures. In thinking about next steps, uh, just like we have in prior years, we will have um, our site administration work with CHS staff to engage in a needs analysis for the site. This really helps drive the work to be specific for each school site and their needs. Now more than ever, we need to ensure effective communication. So site administration and staff fully understands the role of each provider and the specific and unique services that they provide. 
Uh, we need to continue promotion of the supports out in the community and to our families. Um, and that would be via our district's communication tools, uh, via website, social media, etc. And we need to ensure careful data tracking to determine strengths and to troubleshoot areas for growth. Lastly, and very important, we're also seeking approval for the 2020-2021 services agreements for the Center for Human Services providers, specifically the student assistance specialists, behavior consultation clinicians, family support specialists, and the refugee case manager. And with all of that, I am happy to entertain any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. And I see Trustee Brown and then Trustee West. And then can you uh, return the screen back to the live screen? I don't know if Danielle does. There, ah, perfect, awesome. Okay, so I had Trustee Brown and then I said Trustee West. Trustee Walker and then Trustee Irvin. That's the order that you're on my thing. So, okay, Trustee Brown. Thank you for that presentation. And I appreciate that there is some forward thinking of some new ways of addressing needs. Uh, <clears throat> the coffee clutches uh, sound like a great opportunity for families to get involved. And I would just recommend that those be uh, available for an evening option for working parents. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. And I did not mention this, but that we would also be providing those um, in a Spanish, um, a Spanish presentation as well. Great. That's great. Okay, Trustee West. Thank you for this presentation. Um, as you know, this is near and dear to my heart. Um, my question is, how do the Center for Human Services student assistant specialists? collaborate with our own credentialed school counselors that we have in our district? So um, collaboration occurs actually with a number of different school staff, the counselors, teachers, it could be an administrator, um, but they do work uh, together in tandem. Oftentimes the guidance counselor would be meeting with the student, perhaps for a variety of academic reasons, and through their discussions, the counselor might determine that the student needs a little bit more. Um, and so what they do is they provide a referral to the student assistant specialist, and then the SAS with parent permission meets with the student to kind of outline their series of sessions, but they absolutely work in tandem together. And our, our credential school counselors at site, at every site, um, are also trained with social emotional counseling. Do they also have the opportunity to work with kids in those areas as well? Absolutely. Um, if they, typically they're not uh, referred out to the student assistant specialist or the behavior clinician unless they really felt like the topic needed more than they could provide, um, but absolutely they can provide that type of support. Okay, awesome, thank you. Thank you, Trustee Walker. So I'll echo Trusty West. This is something that's been near and dear to me for a long time. Um, my dad worked this issue for decades at Health Services Agency. Um, my real concern sort of going into this isn't that we didn't do the right thing before because we've been actual leaders on this for as long as I've ever paid attention to it. I mean, we've had intervention centers before there were intervention centers. We've expanded them. My real concern gets to this really is to me not a distance learning model solution if you've got students that are really in trouble that intervention center was about a timeout and a personal interaction and given that we've been in a lockdown more or less for four or five months is that a reasonable concern in the sense that it and adding in what you talked about with families there's a number of occasions where the family is actually not the most helpful person of the issue and may very well be the trigger for an issue that got you to the intervention center that got you back on track if i'm making sense you're absolutely making sense uh, mr walker we we know that kids uh, not having the opportunity to be at school and be with their peers and their adult mentors on campus is is taking a toll and so the intervention center SAS that you mentioned, they receive the same similar training as the traditional SAS. And so 
Um, any referral that is made to a student assistant specialist, um, they would have those same types of social emotional trainings, if you will, uh, to be able to provide and support students. The challenge for us has been getting kids to engage in these supports. Um, students are often hesitant to engage and sometimes it takes a, a listening a teacher or a thoughtful friend who reaches out to other school staff and we had a number of occasions this last spring where that in fact happened and so we immediately had Center for Human Services staff reach out to families and students to provide support but there's no doubt that our kids need this support and I hear what you're saying about the IC SAS. I'm hopeful that once schools open back up we can get them right back in place. No, and I agree. I think that's part of the issue here is that and it's something I've worried about since day one is that in a lot of ways, and it's sort of tangential to this agenda issue, is that first set of eyes on that teacher that picked up something that was going wrong that nobody else picked up because they're working with that student that may have resulted in a really good thing or could have ended up in a CPS call. Um, is a lot of that was triggered based on staff, teachers, you know, administrators coming in contact, that personal interaction that didn't require a student to jump to a phone. And I think that's a huge piece of, and this is very different than the instruction. And I think that's why I'm sort of animated about this is there's a difference between teaching addition facts on distance learning and dealing with emotional distances, issues over a, a line. Um, Sue Zwallen, former board member, worked at the ER at the hospital. And one of the things she taught me way back in the day, and I talked to my dad about it, is when you get to extreme cases in this county, there's nobody to handle them. If you go into a 5150 in one of our hospitals, you're in a hallway on a gurney restrained, and somebody's calling to Sacramento, Fresno, or the Bay Area to ship you out. One of our few resources that I knew of locally was Hutton House and they do a phenomenal job but now my understanding is they're retooling and i think what you guys do is amazing i think what the district has done is astonishing i think we've been at the forefront of this for a long time even when we were being criticized heavily for not all those things that mr herbst and you and other members have done have been leading edge but this personal contact and i think the community's lack of understanding of actual certified medical professionals that we lack has never been something that's really been flushed out. And I think part of my statement is you guys do an amazing job. I don't think people realize when you go on a 5150, you're in a hallway and that you get shipped out and that this personal contact is just critical. And you're dealing with teenagers, it's probably even more so. And keep up the good work. It's just a huge concern. Mr. Walker, let me just make one little comment here. Earlier when Dr. Odell was speaking about the various professional development that was going to be provided to teachers, one element that she mentioned was um, providing PD for teachers to help them engage in social emotional type activities and lessons, if you will. And I think that we really have to, to dial into those. That helps us, even though we don't have eyes on a student, it might help us to have ears to hear what they're saying to be able to listen for things that might be an area of concern so i'm pretty pretty excited about those lessons and professional development as another uh, level of support if you will keep on trucking in my list of things i lose sleep over this is one of them and i could be long gone it could be five years down the road and just because of my father and just because of the interest i have in the in the topic i will always lose sleep over this in this valley because of our lack of resources but great work Keep on trucking. All right, thank you, Trustee Walker. Trustee Irvin. Yes, uh, just like Trustee uh, Walker and, and Trustee West, uh, topic is near and dear to my heart as a trained counselor and a certified anger management specialist. Mm -hmm. my, my question is around uh, crisis intervention and what, 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 what things and you know, I'm already aware of the, the great work that the Center for Human Services does uh, that they've been doing at least the 20 years that I've been here and, and watched them grow over the years and respond to the needs of our community from an emotional, uh, social, emotional standpoint. Um, 
but from a crisis intervention standpoint, how do we how do we mitigate that? How do we respond? What plans are in place to respond to those if those come up in this COVID you know uh, environment? How do we respond to crisis um, with 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 students and or within the family itself? Mm -hmm. So again, I would say, as you know, every family situation, every student's crisis situation is different. And depending on the circumstances, we would have a different level of support. Um, we, we, as I mentioned in the presentation, we still have the SAS uh, and cl clinician providers who can do a risk assessment for us uh, amidst school closures. We're in close contact with parents during all of these risk assessments. Um, I'll be honest with you, if a parent does not have the means to take their student to their own private um, doctor or mental health counselor that they've been working with, their option is not one that's favored by Mr. Walker, but they can go to doctor's medical center to receive assistance in that manner. Um, again, depending on the level of severity, we can st set up students with sessions with the behavior clinicians or the student assistance specialists, again, depending on the level of severity. Um, but we, it's definitely a need um, and one that we're uh, mindful to pay close attention to, especially during close uh, school closures. I just, I wanted to chime in. Um, we also have a big contract with Aspirinet that does a lot of our risk evaluations on top of what the center does. So we feel pretty well staffed in that regard. I also really want to give credit to Danielle Hinkle and her team. They had uh, worked hand-in-hand in hand with Mady Herrera on how to deal with extreme situations through a distance learning format, i.e. suicidal ideations. So there's been a lot of information and a protocol that's out there for our school sites to follow, In and hopefully we'd ever run into this uh, situation, but to where we do have some of those extremes that are out there in the community. Okay, okay. I just wanted to know what, what our, our level of um, preparedness was. Uh, in the ship, you know, crisis, um, you know, um, ha happened in that we, we have a, a plan in place. And then I had um, one more question was that um, in terms of, uh, I know we used to get a lot of the interns and things for uh, mental health and counseling and things like that uh, within our, our district. How, how are they be able to be, you know, to get their hours, to be able to get their, you know, get signed off on and training and stuff like that um, as, uh, as well. Mr. Urban, are you referring to interns that are working directly with the school site or those that are working to complete hours through the Center for Human Services? Or I think both. Uh, yeah, both, because I know there's both mm -hmm. kind of overlap depending on what their specialty is. Um, you know, anytime we're in school closures for, for staff to get hours or interns to get hours, they're going to have to be working in a telehealth uh, sort of format. Um, I don't see that waning um, at all. We had a number of um, interns at some of our high school sites this last year. Um, we have counseling interns that come in, but it'll be in the same distance format that we've utilized with our teachers and other staff. It would be in a, a video conferencing type of format. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate all of the adaptations that have had to take place during COVID-19 in order to help meet the needs of our families and our students. So appreciate that and especially for Center for Human Services in working towards that end. And I am I like to hear these new ideas that are coming up. That's great that we have these new opportunities and even the grant for the refugee um, families that have moved in our area. So that was awesome. I, I think I was researching some of that when we were trying to find some grants to help us at one time. So that's great that we have those supports now and finances to be able to support that. Well, this is a report and an approval. So. I will read what we are approving and then I will say, oh, wait, first, before I do that, I have to ask, and I believe we do have a comment. Uh, Ms. Noonan, do we have a comment from the public on this item? Yes, we do. And I will go ahead and read it right now. It is uh, from Steve Collins, and Steve is a behavioral health manager actually at the Center for Human Services. And he says, Modesto City Schools has been amazing to partner with us over the past several years. 
Our clinical staff have enjoyed being able to provide therapeutic services and support to the many schools they serve. During this time of distance learning, we are adapting our approach to reach even more students. Thank you for partnering with us. And that's the only comment I have on this item. OK, thank you. Yes, and I I thought it was Steve Collins from that's a former school board member, but I know he retired from MJC, so don't know if this if it's a relative or not. But anyway, well, that's great. That was a nice comment. And now I am ready to read the item and then take a motion. So we are approving the services agreement with the Center for Human Services to provide student assistance specialist program and general education counseling service family support specialist program and refugee case manager for the 2020 and 2021 school year. So I will take a motion to approve this item. So we're moving for the longest item ever read out. No, actually, I don't think it is the longest, but it, it was long. So Trustee Walker says makes it a motion to approve it. Thank you, Trustee Walker and seconded by Trustee Irvin, did you put your hand up to make a motion, Trustee Irvin? OK. Yes. <laughs> OK, so we've got a motion by Trustee Walker, seconded by Trustee West. All those in favor, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 And I'll just say, are there any opposed? So I don't hear any opposed. I'm believing you all said yes. So the motion okay. passes unanimously. Thank you very Trustee much. So it was actually seconded by Trustee Irvin, I believe. What did I say? Did you I said Trustee not? West. <laughs> I apologize, Trustee Irvin. <laughs> I knew it was Trustee Irvin. I don't know we where sound alike. We sound alike. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you for the correction, Ms. Noonan. Appreciate that. My goodness. OK, must be long evening. Um, B for a report on the draft of the equity and racial justice framework. And I oh. believe Mr. Herbst is going to be doing this one. That's me. Where's Mr. Godot when I need him the most? Let me attempt to share this screen. How are we doing over there? Can we see it? Oh, I, I was right. looking yeah. at a Chicago logo. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully not any longer. Hopefully my uh, camera. OK, goes. I was getting ready to shut my screen down. You got it. We can see you. <laughs> oh, wait, but you guys can see the PowerPoint, right? Yes. yes OK. Yes. Uh, well, good evening, Board President Marks and Trustees. I want to say how much I appreciate uh, the opportunity of being able to share this uh, uh, important work with you. Uh, tonight, I'm going to provide you with a draft and get your input and recommendations on the proposed equity and racial justice framework designed to increase outcomes for student populations that have typically struggled to succeed in our current education system. I plan to discuss the purpose of the equity work I'd like to provide you with a draft of the key actions proposed in the equity and racial justice framework for your feedback. I then plan to increase an existing services agreement that I would take as a consent item for board approval at the August 17th board meeting to expand the work surrounding equity. You can find equity littered throughout our district goals, but I truly believe it most closely aligns with goal one. And that's the idea of increasing academic achievement to ensure equitable access to enable all of our students to attain college and career readiness. There truly are multiple reasons why we feel the need to engage in this work at a deeper level. I believe we would be completely remiss in missing the boat if we don't recognize the unrest that exists across our nation and in our very community. The fact of the matter is inequities exist in our society and also in our district. Over the years, we have made progress uh, in a number of areas. Probably the most noticeable has been regarding discipline, but trust me, even then there's more work that could be done in that area as well as many others. I kind of want to move into the nuts and bolts of the framework. So the framework really proposes actions at multiple levels, including the district, site, and with students. And I want to point out, even though the framework is a one-year, kind of a, what I'm looking for is re recommendations, feedback on the one-year plan, we fully recognize that equity work is not a one and done, meaning we will continue to, uh, to take this work forward in the years to come. But in, in any event, at the district level, we plan to expand the work we started this year with administrators and provide a keynote by Dr. Nancy Dome from Epic Education. Nancy's well respected with her work on equity and has done considerable work in other large districts. 
Dr. Dome and her team provided training to administrators on July 20th and 21st. Both days were incredibly received by, uh, they were received so well by our administrators, high percentages of, of administrative positive feedback. We plan to have Dr. Dome provide a similar training to teachers when they return on August 4th. This is gonna give the teachers kind of the why behind the equity work and build momentum to start the school year. We're also developing a task force that's gonna be led by myself and Dr. Dome. This task force is gonna include school personnel, including administration at the site and district level, teachers, support staff, community members, labor partners, and a variety of other individuals. The primary purpose of this task force is gonna be to provide recommendations to both Dr. Noguchi and the Board of Education. These recommendations will become action items to be completed in subsequent years. We also plan to get community input, so we plan to host a minimum of three public forums. Um, this is gonna be to share the work of the framework and also get um, uh, uh, what, what we hope to accomplish. This is gonna provide an opportunity for us to get feedback though and recommendations from the community as a whole. So not to borrow on the listen and learn, but in this case, it really, really will be the listen and learn, but in a different lens under equity. Our professional development's also been reduced and targeted to ensure we reach a large number of teachers and support staff in areas that support equity. Uh, Dr. Odell has met, we've identified a number of trainings, but just kind of some highlights, restorative practices, cultural competency, implicit bias, uh, bias, student voice, those are just but a handful. Epic Education has created these trainings that could be provided digitally, which will greatly enhance our ability to train large number of staff members, uh, 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 administrators, staff members, and classified personnel. There's also gonna be an end of the year summary presentation, which is gonna highlight the challenges, but also the accomplishments that we ran into during this year and set the table for the work that lies ahead. We plan to train site level teams to enable and empower them to closely examine their own practices as it pertains to uh, equity. I, I, we believe it's pivotal to allow this to, 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 to be at the site level, i.e. because it tends to provide a grassroots approach to that type of work. It also takes into account the individual nuances of a site. What's happening at Marshall may be slightly different than what happens at Kirshen, and that's just one example. Also, there is not a shred of research that I've read that does not uh, uh, include the need and the call to arms to have well-trained principals and vice principals at a school site leading the work. This allows them to be able to build strong coal coal uh, coal uh, coalitions amongst school staff, et cetera, to also kind of drive uh, the work and to build momentum. At the student level, and one of the things I'm truly looking forward to is we not only planning on engaging the inner high council, but we also are, are looking to form what's called the superintendent student council. This is gonna be a group of both formal and informal leaders at a school site. Therefore, we can get a perspective that maybe, and again, inner high council is very connected, but slightly different perspective on their views as it pertains to race and equity at their particular school site. Next steps with your feedback and recommendations, I would uh, look to increase the existing services agreement and to begin the work uh, uh, that I outlined above. The total, co total contract with Nancy and Epic will be 94,500. Uh, as a result of that, assuming uh, uh, to move forward after you're receiving your recommendations, I, I plan to uh, form the task force and get uh, moving on the work that I've outlined above. Um, finally, I, I plan on coming back to the board uh, various times, at least at the end of the year, to kind of give you guys an update on where we're at and again, the challenges, but also the accomplishments that I know that we're going to make. And with that, I am available for any questions that you guys may have. So I, th I think you have your, uh, your mics muted, uh, Board President Marks. I do have my mic muted. Okay, thank you, uh, Jez, um, Mr. Herbs. And then can you bring back the screen? Yeah, let me see, hold on, I'm trying. So uh, we're gonna have uh, Dr. West, uh, Vice President West, and then Trustee Walker, then um, Trustee Lopez, then Trustee Irvin, and then Trustee Newman. Okay, so starting off with Trustee West. I'll make mine quick, first of all, Thank you, thank you, thank you for this important 
job that you're doing by putting together um, by putting together this um, conversation and um, a, a plan for us to go forward with this. I think it's I can't underestimate the importance of, of what that this means to this district and this community. Um, so I just have a really quick question. How can our community members be a part of these committees and these stakeholder groups? What What is the process for them to volunteer to be a part of this? Uh, well, uh, volunteering, you mean, well, the task force, we're gonna have a relatively limited amount of number, but I would ask them to submit, if you have somebody that's interested, they could email me directly. Um, we're looking at probably having about 30 people on a task force, so we want to be kind of selective in terms of who's on it. I mean, you just don't want a task force to become too overwhelmingly big. I would also definitely encourage any community member to be a part of those community forums. I think that that'll be a great opportunity for them to share kind of their insight and feelings uh, 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 toward uh, uh, toward where they, where they think that issues surrounding inequity exist um, in our community and within our district. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Trustee West and Mr. Herbst. Uh, Trustee Walker. I guess my question would be, so I'd have to pair up with uh, President Marks here. <laughs> the question was four years ago, where was this support when we created our equity committee meeting and tried to get folks to address this? And it's interesting because it ended up being eight of us in a room maybe, but this sort of support then would have been phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And pr President Marks and I sat in the boardroom which was our committee room with little or nothing other than a piece of paper and please show up. So we certainly moved fast forward here because um, it was it was four years ago mm -hmm. we were attempting to do this. And so that goes back to leadership with our superintendent and everybody else and how much ground we've covered. I think my only comment would be and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see the student input. And generally my comment on the issue of certainly equity with education and how we look at biases, I have far less concern about the students than I do about the adults. <laughs> because when I watch students compared to when I grew up in the 70s in the South with a mixed race marriage to where we are now and I watch students and kids interact, whether it be music or sports or whatever it is, they are light years ahead of where we were. And so I'm looking for that. I'd like to certainly watch what their feedback is, but my real hope and focus is, is that it percolates out to the adults. Because yeah. I think that's where the real bias is that's sort of built in. And I think that's where the real work will sort of pay off long-term. Because when I look at young people today, other than those that are like throwing things, most of them seem so far beyond where we were 20 years ago that it's just impressive. Trustee President Marks, we tried this. Well, and we had great dialogue and we did come up with some ideas. We just have a whole different leadership now than we had back then. So I, I believe we'll do a, accomplish a lot more this time around than we did then in our district. So I agree with you, but it was it was good to have the dialogue and the students. I love the student input. We did have those awesome students on our uh, committee. That was great. So I think a third of our committee was students. So yeah, I, think, I think to answer that one question when you asked, how did you get in? I took, we took every single student who applied. And I think the one or two people that were community members we didn't take were not parents. And every time I've ran into either one of those individuals, I have been hammered <laughs> and have never tried to commit create a committee again because not choosing somebody because we chose parents and students has never stopped haunting me. Yeah, that's right. You're right. Thank you. OK, Trustee Lopez. Well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, thank you very much for um, for starting this. Like like uh, uh, Dr. Charlene mentioned, it's very important that we have this, that we have these conversations. Um, I don't have a question. I have more of a uh, recommendation. I, I mean, my question was, how do we, how does uh, community folks get in the process, right? But um, uh, Dr. West is right on the money from the get-go. Um, um, my my recommendation is that we make this, however big this task force is, that we make it community heavy, um, that the community or student heavy, that they, the community and students and 
and I know that the last thing we worry about is our students. We, we saw the great work they've done earlier in the in the in the months um, speaking out ar around injustice, speaking out about, you know, um, equity, right? Um, but we need their input to to guide our to guide our work. Um, so I would definitely recommend that we make this community and and student heavy. Um, the second recommendation is that we we set ourselves a goal of of how many people we want to see in the community uh, from community, how many people we want to see uh, out in community forums or hear from in community forums, um, so that we that we can we can. Uh, we can stay honest and we, to our work, right? That we that we did our our due diligence and and achieving um, real input. Um, so those would be my recommendations. And I know that uh, that uh, that that we have someone at at the helm that that would make that happen. So I'm I'm assured that that would get done. But those those would be my my two re recommendations. Appreciate the recommendations. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Trustee Irvin. Uh. Yes, um, uh, along those lines of uh, Trustee Lopez, you know, making sure we have that community uh, 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 representation, uh, that representative of our community as a whole, um, we, we, you know, we have an opportunity to do some great work. And then going back to President Marks in terms of the difference between the other times, because we can go back to 2005 when I led as a district led the diversity task force, which yeah. had a had a vision of equity and on all of that uh, good stuff back in 2005. Mm -hmm. You know, again, uh, it's one thing for the leadership to say, hey, that's a good idea. Let's go with it. It's another thing for leadership to say, we support you. We're going to provide you with the resources needed to be able to make this a success. So um, I go back to 2005 because that's when um, I was selected to to lead that task force, and so uh, moving forward, um, I agree. We I, I think the leadership is in place to be able to uh, bring the necessary tools, uh, experience, and resources to to elevate us to the next level uh, and not become stagnant um, in this process because it's it's not new for us. Uh, it's just a new day now. And so um, how we respond uh, right now is going to be uh, the community is going to be watching because the same community members that were making these um, uh, bringing this to the forefront back then are still around. They're still they're, they're still looking for the change. And I say I think change is on the horizon. Um, and with that, I just have a question. It was a couple questions that were uh, given to me by community members. Um, around the equity um, uh, e equity work and racial justice. And uh, one uh, person said, is there thought being given to how to build to how to build capacity through this process that so that when future needs arise to have an organization and also to have an organization like Epcot, which we have, you know, involved uh, in the facilitation process and um, and and can we hire? They also had a question: Can we hire locally su uh, and support our own community and economy in terms of when we need to look for resources and uh, advancing this work? Uh, we have people in our community uh, that have expressed interest to to share their knowledge and expertise in that that area. And so, um, you know, we're we're on the forefront again. <laughs> you know, I would like to say, but um, I think that this, this is going to be a new day. Um, I think change is change is going to happen. Um, I'm thinking about Sam Cooke right now. His 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 song change <laughs> change, and so um, um, we just have to remember that you know we got to keep our students and our families at the forefront because this is all about them. This is this is all about them. And, and 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 if we're serious about changing the paradigm and shifting it in the right direction, um, this is the work that can get us there because it has with other districts, it has with other communities. It's time that we 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 take the gauntlet and really do something with it. 
That's all uh, I have. So, so Trustee Irvin, so Trustee Irvin, I'd like to um, address the the, the question, the first question you had, which is um, centered to the work that really um, went into the part of the planning, and that is how do you build capacity so it lives past this year and lives past my superintendency? So how I framed this um, goal with managers was by the time that I'm no longer the superintendent of Modesto City, I want to make sure that equity is in the fabric of what we do and it's in the culture. So to do that, let, let me speak to how are we building that in. So first off, um, we have deep professional development this year for a lot of teachers. So that's that's one piece to it. But at the heart of it is also building the capacity of um, our district level leadership to be able to carry this on because we don't want it to be contingent on a consultant or someone from the outside. And that's why Mr. Herps is going to be co-facilitating and learning from Dr. Dome and her work, how to build those skills with him and his team. So we'll have a, a, a team of facilitators, but equally as important is the trainer of trainers uh, model for our site um, teams. So embedded in that site work is training individuals at the different sites to be trainers themselves of, of the work at their sites. And then lastly, um, the students. If we don't get to the students, if we don't get it embedded in what they're doing and what they're saying and what they're sharing, this isn't going to work. This is all really just a bunch of activities, right? At the center of this work is empowering of our empowering our students to do the work and also to be ambassadors of um, behaviors and also um, checking other students and also adults in the system. And so what we wanna do with the superintendent's um, um, uh, team or superintendent's student council is to bring a set of informal leaders from our high school and our junior highs to meet with myself, Mr. Herps and his team to listen and learn from them, but equally as important to train them to be ambassadors to go back out to their school sites. So um, when we talk about um, building capacity, it's literally at every single level. Um, Dr. Dome and myself and Mark and, and the others that were on the call about a month ago, that was at the center of really the model that we're building. And again, we start this year and we continue moving it um, um, next year as well. That's good. Okay. Thank you. Is that all that you had, Trustee? Uh, uh, yes, yes, on that. All right. So I just want to make a comment. I just appreciated your leadership when you did do the diversity training. That was awesome. I don't remember the gentleman's name that you had come out of town here. I think he was from Stockton or maybe between Stockton and the Bay Area. He was great. I still remember those meetings and they still have affected me. So thank you for that. And I know only two board members took the time to go to those trainings. So that was um, interesting. But uh, I know we are in new times and new place and it's great to be here now and see where we're headed. All right, I have Trustee Newman next. All right. Well, thank you, um, uh, my fellow board members that have added your input, it's so valuable. And I also just wanna thank the superintendent I think that um, my two cents on this is with regard to the student voice, that's going to be the most important component of it. I just want to echo what Dr. Noguchi just said and and having, you know, having high school student and having had both my sons in leadership, I could kind of speak to this uniquely. And, and that is that the student voice you probably need to hear from is probably not going to come from your traditional leadership classes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important to recognize. And it, it's not that it, it's likely the kids we need to hear from are, are the ones that probably aren't going to fill out the application and try and get on this and get on a committee. So it's just really important that we try and figure out a way to get that voice that we really need to hear. And it doesn't mean we should exclude leadership students because they're going to be important conduit of getting it out into the student body. But we have to hear from the experiences of students that, that we need to hear from. And likely it, it's, it, it may not, they may not be in that leadership classes at our high school sites. 
And so, so that's going to be, um, I would, I would reach out to charge the leadership students with, with giving you some names of students that, Hey, these, you should listen to these people. Cause it's interesting to hear my, my sons talk about students that they know that are very different than them, but have a different and unique perspective and do appear to be kind of leaders on campus. So the leadership students might be a place to start, um, to ask them, who do you think we should talk to? Um, I also think that it's important for our students to feel like this is a safe place for them to say what their experiences are. I don't want any um, student to come away from this and feel even more alienated, even more, um, even more like they can't that that we aren't listening to them. And so, uh, and that that is a possibility. So, with um, with you know balancing the adults in the room with the students in the room and making sure that that student voice is heard. And uh, so it, it needs to be a safe place for them. I do think that that having maybe some teachers involved is important because we need their buy-in on this. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of parents versus community members, um, because again, I really want to hear from the students because I do believe our students, as as um, Trustee Walker pointed out, our students have very different views on this than than even you know we do. And certainly, people even older than than those of us sitting on the board. And so, um, we need to make sure that voice is heard. Uh, so, uh, I think that in terms of parents versus community members, I'd like to see more parents uh, because I think that you know maybe their their children have shared things over the years that have happened to them, and they know some personal experiences. Parents are really hard to get involved. They they probably already feel disenfranchised. Um, and they're and this is a difficult time to hear from them. And so we need to have a mechanism for parents to um, send in a confidential comment um, or experience and share share an experience for them to at least be a part of it and provide us some effective input. And and again, it needs to be all of this has to be for me it's very important. It has to be a safe place uh, for anybody to share their views and to feel safe and um and sharing those views so these are that's my two cents i know you needed some feedback on how to how to go forward with this i'm very excited i think this is an important step we're at a unique time in our history that we need to do this and um, it's imperative and um and so it's worth the time and the attention that we're spend that we need to spend on this in in the midst of a pandemic um it's just it's it's when it needs to happen so thank you for taking the thank you for making it a priority. Yes, it is. Thank you for all the comments. Those thank are great feedback. comments. Yes, thank you. Thank you, board, and for all your experiences that you've added into this time. I also uh, I want to ask Ms. Noonan. I do believe we have some comments to be read at this time. So yes. please read the comments from sure. The you got it. Um, so these are the comments that we received on item B4. Uh, the first one comes from Tamara McCarthy and Tamara is from Enox High School. She's an English instructor as well as their yearbook advisor. She actually has some questions on item B4. Um, so perhaps Mr. Herbst, if, you, if you'd like to maybe get back to her after this, but what are your priorities in addressing the impact of the three pandemics and in parentheses racial justice COVID-19 and the economy with our students what is the specific plan for doing that the second question is what is the desired outcome for designing the equity and racial justice framework what do you hope to achieve third question is who is driving this equity work is it epic is it the task force is it the community and the fourth question is who is on the task force what is the representation is it community members administrators parents students teachers and what will they be working to accomplish so that's um that's the first comment that we have then we have another comment from Elizabeth Guptel and Elizabeth, I hope I've pronounced her last name correctly. Uh, she's a second grade teacher from Muir Elementary School. And her comment is, I would like to encourage the board to support the MCS administration in their efforts to create a more equitable district by utilizing a framework, professional development, curriculum, and a task force. 
The next comment we have is, it's actually from Wendy Bird. Wendy is the president of the Modesto Stanislaus NAACP. She actually has a comment both on B4 and B5, but it's naturally separated. So I'm just gonna read her comment right now on item B4 and then I'll, I'll once you get to B5, I'll read that one. Um, so her comment is, I applaud MCS for taking a stance on a long overdue initiative of institutionalizing equity and racial justice within its framework. I hope that this will occur not only in terms of curriculum, but also in terms of hiring practices, policies and procedures across the board. We need strong measures in place to ensure equity and diversity among teachers, administrators, and support staff. And the last comment that we have, this comment actually applies to both, and it's, it's uh, both item B4 and B5 that you've yet to read, um, but it's, it applies to both, so I want to make sure that I get that on the record. So this is from Elizabeth Garman, and she is uh, both a parent and a teacher here at Modesto City Schools. Um, her comment is, good day, my name is Elizabeth Garman. I'm a parent and teacher of MCS and I am in support of item um, B4 and B5. The proposed framework and ethnic studies adoption is one thing of many things to be accomplished in order to educate ourselves and our community and make a more just and better world for all. Sincere regards, Elizabeth Garman. And it looks like those are all the comments that we have on item B4. And like I said, her comment also applied to item B5. All right. But I will, have, I will have more comments on B5 once you get to that portion. Yes. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you, uh, Ms. Noonan, for that. I have a comment from Trustee Brown. Is that correct? You need to unmute. Thank you. So I think it's interesting that we've had numerous board meetings with very little public comment. And the fact that we have multiple comments on this issue stresses the importance. It would be very easy for a district to focus strictly on distance learning right now, but I am grateful that our district has taken a stance to address this uh, uh, much needed social attention to an issue that our nation is facing. So I, I applaud and thank our district for uh, moving forward at this time when it would be easy to push any other issues aside because we have so many other things to work on. So thank you to all that are putting the emphasis where it needs to be. Okay, thank you, Trustee Brown. And that concludes item B4 on the draft of the equity and racial justice framework. And now, <coughs> oh man, this was fine. Hang on just a moment. <clears throat> I think I'm okay now. Okay, it just hits us. I think the air conditioner in here gets us with the pollen every so often. And Two of us in here get our eyes all watery. All right, next item, B5, approval of adoption of resolution number 2021-02, affirming support of AB2 2016 California Ethnic Studies Model Curriculum Draft in support of Save California Ethnic Studies Initiative. Mr. Herbst. Me again, yeah, uh, good evening. Um, Tonight, we bring forward re a resolution that supports AB 2016, California Ethnic Studies Model Curriculum Draft. Ethnic Studies is a critical and interdisciplinary study of race and ethnicity with a focus on the experiences and perspectives of people of color within the United States. Since the 1960s, scholars have analyzed the ways in which race and ethnicity continue to be powerful social, cultural, and political forces impacting access to opportunities. We applaud the support and support the efforts that's being done by the California Department of Education to ensure curriculum for the ethnic studies model curriculum includes fair representation of marginalized groups and those who are facing increased challenges in the current global climate and them wanting to bring this education into our secondary classrooms. 
It's recommended that the Board of Education adopt the resolution of forming support of AB 2016 California Ethnic Model Schools Draft. And I will uh, happy to entertain any questions. Okay, so I have Trustee Irvin has a question. Yeah, but Mr. Irvin, don't you dare, uh, you, you know, you know, I know you know this stuff inside and out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to, you know, just, just to comment. Um, like I said, I, I've been working with a statewide group, uh, an ethnic study and defense of ethnic studies who actually brought this uh, bill uh, to the state. And there's over 124 organizations and school and schools who have uh, supported this uh, model curriculum draft. And I, I'm glad we were able to uh, bring it forth to our board uh, here in Modesto City Schools because it's ethnic studies, I, I think, will, will go a long way with having students really understand um, other cultures, um, um, the racial groups uh, that, that make up our community. Um, I'm, again, I'm going to go back 10, 12 years. I tried to bring it to Modesto High School, the ethnic studies course at Modesto Junior College, set up a partnership with the college to uh, have the class uh, taught on campus there and they would receive college credit. And uh, things kind of, you know, got, got derailed again uh, in, that, in that process. And I just think that, you know, this is a, a really good way for us to really solidify our equity work uh, and complementing it with ethnic studies. And hopefully we can get it as part of a graduation requirement in, in the future, the very near future. Um, like I said, I taught ethnic studies at MJC for a number of years, uh, the same class we tried to bring to Modesto High School um, for our students in Modesto, High, Modesto City Schools. Um, and I couldn't even get past unless seeing what the interest of the students going back to Trustee Newman is letting the students decide if it's a class they would take and doing a survey of those students and say, hey, if this class was offered, would you enroll and take the class? And so um, um, I'm glad we're here again. I'm glad the leadership is in place that can move this forward. Um, uh, Mark uh, has gotten a really um, um, good response from the community, from folks that I've talked to that really think that he is going to be the one to uh, help uh, help to uh, lead this forward um, uh, with Dr. Uh, our superintendent um, umbrella. So I'm looking forward to seeing what what kind of progress we make. And I think we're, run, we're going in the right direction uh, with this. Because we got many students who go to our campuses or our diverse campuses. And and sometimes you when I was on Modesto High for a year over there, you know, you saw the groups of students. Um, you always see the different groups of students, whether they broken up by culture or by race, you know, on the campus there. And then you had your butterfly students that they can wolf in and out of the different groups themselves. But they were the they was the exception rather than the rule. And mm -hmm. so for uh, uh, and I think the ethnic studies will help bridge that 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 gap on campus where more students will cross, you know, cross over to different uh, uh, um, cultural and racial groups on campus, and rather than see the pockets of students, you know, it was almost that you saw all the students together when it was a ball game, mm -hmm. game and things like that. When it was on campus, you can just walk campus. I always observe that. They're different different groups uh, of students and students, and so I think this would help uh, bridge that, that <clears throat> divide and be more harm, um, homogenous uh, on our campuses. So um, I'm really excited about uh, about this work. And there's another bill for the CSUs uh, as well. Mm -hmm. The CSUs are trying to make it a graduation requirement within the CSU system as well, and so they have a, a equal uh, bill. Uh, going before the legislator to do the same. So it'd be nice to be able to have it go from, you know, high school, I've had ethnic studies to get to college, I got ethnic studies and, you know, and, and move forward. So that's all I have. Sorry to be so verbose. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Love it up so high. That was so great. Love hearing all that. I remembered it because I 
wanted my students to go there because I was a guest speaker into the high schools when long time ago. And so when my boys were getting uh, the age for high school, I wasn't in Modesto High District, but I wanted them to go there because I said to me at the time in 2000, or well, in the nine, late 90s, that was the best high school in Modesto with the diversity. It had the most diversity. And so I loved it. And the students were just phenomenal. So I was really happy to see that. Now this whole city <laughs> is very diverse, but Modesto High at that time was the really diverse high school. All right, Trustee Walker. Oh, Trustee Walker. Okay. I agree mostly with Mr. Irvin. I think what's interesting when I look at this is that because I've got two students who have now once graduated and one's a senior. And when I compare what they know about sort of ethnic studies, I had more by the time I got to high school 40 years ago in Georgia than they've ever gotten. And I just find that interesting, just troubling too. But it was just interesting because 40 some odd years ago, when you had different ethnic events going on, it was infused in everything you were doing. Black History Month wasn't a stand up and say, hey, you did book reports. You know, you knew all these different people and Harriet Tubman wasn't something that you saw in a movie. And it really was embedded within the culture, which I find interesting because I grew up in Georgia and we get a lot of grief on these issues. But in all reality, it was much more infused. Um, and then to Trustee Irvin's point about colleges, one of the college courses I had to take was a diversity course. It wasn't labeled that, but I spent an entire semester studying Hispanic culture in California. And so that was there. I think what I'm mostly concerned about here is that we go slow to go fast. And I think I've talked to Dr. Noguchi about this, is that we take an incremental approach and really try to build something that is righteous and good and as the depth of the coverage and i think doing it the way we're talking about it makes sense and here's the red flag i'll raise every single time the legislature in california for the last decade has ginned up a new set of standards or frameworks and then pushed them out it's been a train wreck when they push out early curriculum materials see engage new york i mean see eureka i mean it's just not been well thought out and so I think to Trustee Irvin's point, get this right and really take the time to work through the process and get something that is solid and fundamental and not necessarily take our lead from the political monkey business in Sacramento, because I think for the most part, they have misled and given misinformation over a very long period, certainly for the last decade. And I have far more faith in Mr. Hertz Dr. Noguchi, Ms. Hinkle, Ms. Odell, Dr. Odell now, to get it right, go slow, go fast, get this right. And I still find it extraordinarily interesting that 40 years after I left high school, my kids get less of it in California than I had by eighth grade in Georgia. But keep up the good work and go slow to go fast, please. Thank you. All right, thank you, Trustee Walker. Trustee Lopez. Oh, you're muted, Trustee Lopez. There Sorry you go. about that. That's all right. Was, That's good. I was like, wait, he's talking. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I was very inspired. I wanted, uh, I just went straight to it. But no, I really appreciate that that we're taking the steps on the on the previous item, and the one that we're taking today, I think, is is vital. I know that um, um, Trustee Irvin, like the great work that he's done. Um, I mean, I saw some of that in, in high school myself, um, and I and I think more than more than learning about other other um, ethnicities is the importance of seeing your ethnicity. Well, I was going to say in textbook, but those are going to fade away <laughs> really soon. So seeing themselves in in the curriculum, I, I think, is very important for the um, for the growth of a, of a of a human being of being represented not only in your neighborhood, but being represented in 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 our education system, and you see that with our teachers, you see that in our um, in our staff. But you, it is it, amazing that we're not going to get to see that in our in our curriculum. So um, definitely appreciative of the work, and I know that uh, Mr. Herbs and Dr. Naguchi are the right people to to lead on this work. Um, and 
we'll, we'll, we'll be right here to support. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. I hear you chirping in the background. I think it's the fire alarm. Mine chirped all last week, so I was like, I need my husband to fix that. So that's great. It's good to see you. I love what you said, um, Adolfo. That was really good, and, and it, we're looking forward to this. So I have one question on the last paragraph on the first page was, did we, did we edit this or not? Because when I had it, it says, be it further resolved that the Board of Education affirm support for Pacific Islander studies, Arab American studies, Central American studies, and West Asian American studies, and their continued inclusion in the ESMC curriculum. So it did not mention African American or um, that. So I was wondering, is that because it's assumed that it's in there already because it is nowhere in this? So help me out here. Somebody let me know. Is this supposed to be yeah, added? Let me, or? Let me take it. Or I, I actually think I got the answer, John. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the, 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 this, the, the, the bill went, went through an, a, a, a number of years ago. Yeah, 2016. There's some, yeah, there's been some work that, um, that has been done, including public comment. And right now, kind of one of the things that's being held up is kind of a debate between a handful of the minorities, three of which that you just mentioned that were not included in the original draft. So this is affirming the support of those. I, I, African-American and other, other uh, 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 ethnicities are included. And Dr. Irvin, please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but I had done some research on this over the weekend just to make sure I could address that question. No, that's, that's yeah. exactly why. It wasn't yes. in the original model curriculum. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, so they're adding it to it because I, I thought, here we go through all of this. If we no. don't have African American in here. So, all right. Okay, I just want to make sure because sure. I asked that on Thursday and was, was like, wait, this is missing in here. So, okay. Um, thank you very much. Now we are ready for comments from the public. Miss Noonan. Okay, and there are there are quite a few on this item, so I will uh, try to be as clear as possible. Um, so the first comment comes from Wendy Bird, again, the president of the Modesto Stanislaus NAACP. And Wendy says, I support the resolution affirming AB 2016 California Ethnic Studies Model Curriculum Draft. As we move toward 21st century preparedness, history has taught us that race does matter. Our country was built off of multiple frameworks designed to promote racial disparities. In order to correct that, schools must be intentional about charting a new course that prepares students for a multiracial society. Ethnic studies is a perfect tool for building bridges between cultures. Students will become more enthusiastic about learning with a more in-depth culturally based curriculum. Relationship building, problem solving, and getting along is just as important in life as science and math. The massive protests all over the world following the George Floyd murder was testimony of an outcry for change. Systemic racism is not just about police brutality, it is also about structural racism in education. In order to move forward, we have to be intentional about changing the flow of information in order to serve the better good. Again, hats off to transformational and new thought leaders like Dr. Noguchi, staff and teachers who see this vision. Thank you, Wendy Bird. Okay, um, the next comment comes from Magdalene Strong and she says, hello there. I wanted to profess my support for making ethnic studies a part of Modesto City Schools curriculum in regards to item B5 on your agenda for today's meeting. I think, I think ethnic studies would be an invaluable addition to the curriculum, focusing on the experiences and perspectives of people of color in US history is so critical for our young people and for society at large. This is truly a crucial move by Modesto City Schools and would indeed demonstrate a commitment to inclusion and a celebration of diversity. Thank you, Magdalene Strong. The next comment comes from Miranda Bacchus, and she's a Modesto resident and alumni of MCS. Uh, to whom it may concern, I think that it is vital to implement ethnic studies into curriculum for several reasons. 
First, it provides a mirror for children that are often not within books or curriculum to see themselves. Second, it provides a window for children that often see themselves within books and curriculum to see people that are different from them. Lastly, teaching accurate history will push our country to acknowledge the sacrifices and contributions that, and then she uses an acronym, BIPOC, have made to our country. Please strongly consider including ethnic studies in your district. It will benefit future generations and our society as a whole. Sincerely, Miranda Bacchus. And then we have uh, Cynthia Robles. And Cynthia says, hello, I am emailing to show my support for making ethnic studies a part of the school curriculum. In light of recent events, this will help our students understand important issues that impact their community. Too many times, students in the Central Valley are left behind and with ethnic studies, it will empower them. Thank you, Cynthia Robles. And then we have a comment from Rose Mitchell and Rose says, Dear Superintendent, please be advised that I fully support ethnic studies program being adopted into the curriculum in middle and high schools within the MCS system. It is important that true facts of all ethnic cultures be known to students and taught by unbiased educators. And we have one more, let's see, oops, hang on, sorry, I lost my, oh, here we go. Um, I didn't lose my place. We had another comment from Elizabeth, Elizabeth Guptel, again, second grade teacher from Muir Elementary School. And she's also a parent of high school students and member of the MTA equity team. And Elizabeth says, it is critical that MCS approve a resolution that supports AB 2016, which requires the offering of ethnic studies at the high school level. The board needs to move forward in offering an ethnic studies course. The next comment, we're, al we're almost there. The next comment is from Peri Robeson, who is a Modesto resident. They say, my name is Peri Robeson. I was born and raised in Modesto. I fully support implementing ethnic studies into regular school curriculum. It is extremely important and necessary to reach our children the correct history so we can all have a better understanding of one another. And I think they may have said to teach our children the correct history, um, but I'm just reading it as it came over. Um, the next comment is from Pam Robeson, uh, who is an educator. And they say, I'm emailing you in support of making ethnic studies a requirement in regular school curriculum. I taught in Modesto for 30 plus years, and it is crucial to implement ethnic studies into regular curriculum so children can have a better understanding of who they are and their peers around them. Thank you, Pam Robeson. Then we have a comment from Dottie Lobu, and Dottie says, to whom it may concern, I would like to express my support for ethnic studies becoming a part of the Modesto City School curriculum. This would give students the opportunity to learn in a new capacity about themselves and each other, as well as resulting in fostering them to become well-rounded, educated, and compassionate citizens. Ethnic studies has always been and will always continue to be relevant to students' lives. Thank you for your time. Sincerely, Dottie Labu. And then we have Gabriela Fierro, and she's a Modesto resident. And she says, I deeply appreciate the opportunity to voice my belief that required ethnic studies in Modesto City Schools is critically important. My black and brown children deserve to experience the same ownership, pride, and engagement of their education that comes from being represented and seeing themselves in the curriculum. It speaks volumes about our community that ethnic studies is being, in quotes, considered in 2020. This is simply a part of education if there is no agenda to admit it. The education that is presented in public school forms the forms the belief of a community. What better way to grow a more cohesive community than to teach children about each other? It is time for Modesto to be an anti-racist leader for the broader community. My youngest son has been raised in Modesto. When I approached his teacher about recognizing Black History Month, the, res the response I received was that this was not part of the curriculum. 
recognizing my son was not part of the school year. I'm excited to see Modesto City Schools pave the way for Stanislaus County. Sincerely, Gabrie Gabriela Fierro, Modesto resident. And the last comment for item B5 is from Ariana Soto Zuniga. And Ariana says, Hello, I am emailing in regards to making ethnic studies part of the curriculum. I believe this would be very helpful to students and teachers since it goes hand in hand with culturally sustaining pedagogy. Students do not get exposed to history and literary works that reflect their identity. I understand this is a new step and it will not be perfect at first. However, Adding this class into the curriculum will allow for an additional space for students to participate in dialogue and also serve as a new frontier for co-teaching between the teacher and student. Thank you. Sincerely, Ariana Soto Zuniga. And that is all of the comments that I have for, uh, in addition to the one I read earlier from uh, Elizabeth Garman, the combo. So that's everything I have. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> No worries. Thank you. And thank you to the public who commented on their support of this. And we appreciate that. So now we are ready to take a motion and a second to approve this, unless there's any other comments. I don't see any hands up. So, so all move. Right. ready? So move. Yes, <laughs> Trustee Irvin, thank you very much. Seconded by? Second. Trustee Lopez. All those in favor, please say aye. I. Aye. 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 Right. I don't see all the mics on. Any opposed? I don't see any opposed. All right. So thank you, uh, trustees. And now I have the next item was, are there any items to be placed on future Board of Agenda? I do not see any and we did not receive any, so I will entertain a motion to close the meeting. Yeah. Trustee Chad, uh, Trustee Brown, Trustee Walker seconds it. All those in favor, aye. Thank aye. you very much aye. for meeting you guys. I know it went longer than we were hoping and <laughs> and I'm going to blame um, the super